Malaysian 370, contact Ho Chi Minh 120, decimal 9. Uh, good night. Good night, Malaysian uh, 370. Breaking news tonight, a Malaysia Airlines flight with 239 people on board, including four Americans, has gone missing. Oh, wow. I was muted the whole time. I apologize. Okay. Well, we're going to try that again. Thanks, guys, uh, for being here. Apologize if you just jumped on. Staycation Jason, Chris D, Aaron, Cat Can, Skinny Bob, uh, John Hold, UAP, Zach, Lottie, uh, Sandy Victor, um, JL, Chadwell, Vince, From Thought. I think I got you. Still Joe, Kathy D. Aaron Sham Six, Ainsley Wallace, uh, Cipher, Bernie. Nice to see you, man. Nice to see you. Sorry, I muted myself in the beginning. Apologize, apologize. Um, did we get everybody else? So you guys just got a little bit extra. DJ Zero Action. I was just testing you guys to see if you guys were here, paying attention. Annie William, appreciate you. Uh, thanks, Professor J. The interview with Tom uh, was really good. I, I have to agree on that one. Um, if you guys haven't checked out the interview with Tom Montauk, I'm, I'm probably going to take a clip and then and post the the YouTube link to it tomorrow. Um, definitely worth checking out. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Uh, appreciate it. Super sticker. I don't know what that means, but thank you very much. Uh, let's see. TL, Jack, nice to see you. There we go. You guys can hear me now. Awesome. Okay, I'm just we're letting a few people trickle in here. Thanks, Z Jalapeno, for being here. George, I don't recall. Uh, Fod, hello, aliens. Yeah, hello, I, guys. I'm all in on the uh, futuristic interdimensional mantids. I feel like maybe that's the the missing link here. Um, so yeah, appreciate the the, the kind words as well. Uh, Victor says liked watching the stream last night. 
tonight's stream is not going to be about dunking on debunkers or anything like that. Uh, I don't really like doing those streams. Uh, I don't really like having to be a negative person in general. But when you are disclosing uh, free energy and warp travel and conspiracies big enough to be, you know, country versus country, uh, you got to go ahead and you got to use every weapon at your disposal. Uh, you can't back down at all to people. Um, we have to learn from the people that try to disclose this information in the past and not say, make the same mistakes that they did. Uh, when we look at the Y Files episode today, we're going to find out that a lot of people have been suppressed. It's been really easy. Um, cynicism is a big problem. Uh, when people are very cynical, then you find that uh, it's impossible to disclose information. They go, well, why don't you make one? Okay, well, here's one. Well, that's nothing. Or then they go, well, why isn't the government like, uh, you know, why isn't it talked about on CNN or, you know, they don't realize the government will make you sign a non-disclosure agreement or take your take your invention and, and take away your discovery from you. Uh, it's it's pretty crazy. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first thing I want to do is cheers, everyone, as well. Thank you very much for being here. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, so. This is probably where I want to start here with Limitless's comment. This is the most fascinating conspiracy out there. I think I agree. I think that's why it gets it resonates with people so much is that it's an incredible uh, conspiracy um, in terms of what's being hidden from us. And we're talking about MH370, but also free energy uh, today. You know, we talked about free energy. So the thing about MH370 that's so compelling, guys, is not even though probably just the conspiracy angle alone is pushes it to one of the top conspiracies of all time. The idea that a country would uh get involved and destroy a plane and then hide it but it's not it's not the top right we have done stuff like that before twa flight 800 highly speculated the united states government shot down the plane lied to the world about it they found a bunch of debris the difference with mh370 is we didn't find any plane the debris that washed up washed up in africa but we've got satellite pings that indicate the plane should have crashed near australia and no debris washed up in australia we didn't find one body we didn't find one piece of luggage we find less than 1% of the debris in a location that's too far for it to have drifted in the time it was found. It has questionable barnacle growth on it that indicates it might not have been in the water as long as people think. We should just probably think freely because when we realize and look at that evidence, we go, huh, this plane can't have crashed in the South Indian Ocean. And we looked everywhere and we found nothing. No black boxes, nothing in the South Indian Ocean. The logical conclusion should be something else happened to it. Maybe it crashed somewhere else or what have you. But this is where the MH370 videos come in. They are extremely de detailed, realistic. We've got two videos, both from military sources. And we we're able to find a guy that the timing says that he's the guy that leaked them. And when you look at those videos, we see the plane getting warped out of the sky using physics that could only make sense if it was already out there somewhere else. Someone had seen it and discovered it and suppressed it because it means the military's had it for potentially decades. So... The conspiracy leads to the videos, which leads to this idea that we can warp an object. And if we can warp an object, we're talking about science that is very advanced. And this is where we dug into then and we started digging through that science. Uh, our buddy Dave Rossi proposed the idea of a fourth orb and the idea of macroscopic phase conjugation. That's pretty much all he said. He never explained to me how it all worked. He kind of gave me some thoughts in terms of how to think about it. And then we start digging around. Then we find Thomas Bearden. Thomas Bearden teaches us that scalar physics can do the exact thing that we need for macroscopic phase conjugation. And then we find mixed wave interferometry. And by looking at uh, optical phase conjugation, and we find out it's a similar concept and it can use gravitational waves. And this is how we find out about Thomas Bearden. And this leads to also free energy. If you guys look at my earlier posts about MH370 back in October, Read the letter to Congress. I literally call out free energy in the letter to Congress. This was before I even started looking into electrical engineering. You can just tell that that's what a requirement is when you look at these videos. In order to be able to warp an object, we basically need access to unlimited energy. Um, and it turns out that, sure enough, there are free energy devices out there. Actually, of many different kinds. Uh, over unity, coefficient of performance greater than one. But now there's two different things going on. And this is where I want to start by clarifying something for the people out there that think they're going to debunk me. First of all, I welcome uh, any debunk attempts into free energy and what have you. 
we are going to violate uh, the law of conservation of energy. We are going to violate that law. Uh, we're going to have to rewrite it. And we're going to have to add an energy to it, uh, negative energy, essentially, uh, that we can get a, a limited amount from uh, from the vacuum, uh, from the ether. Now, they call it part, uh, you know, um, virtual particles is what they say. Oh, we've got virtual particles. Well, another way to look at it is we've got an ether of unlimited uh, energy that we can tap into like an, like we're tapping into oil, but it just is an infinite amount all around us all the time. And we are going to cheat the laws of thermodynamics that say that you can't get more energy out of a system that you put in. And we're going to cheat that too. Remember, we've been talking about it. It came from Dave Rossi. Watch Hard Truths, number three, I think it was. Open our system up like Pac-Man's mouth. Open it up. Open the system up to the energy all around us all the time. There is enough energy in this martini right here to vaporize all the oceans on the face of the earth. Cheers. If anyone out there doesn't like what I'm saying and can prove it wrong, go for it. Go for it. I'm challenging you. And yes, I understand that making statements like this is not proof, technically. No. Uh, the confidence comes from the fact that I know that it's real. And I know that it won't be able to be disproven. And that the, phys the physical equations are going to have to be rewritten. Um, so we are going to be violating a little bit, but we're not going to necessarily violate general relativity. We can bend space-time. And you may say, well, if we can communicate faster than the speed of light, then you're going to violate causality. Maybe, maybe not. What if time dilation corrects for it? I'd be curious if someone can prove that's potentially wrong. Or maybe we are. Maybe it's like I talked about Tom Montauk yesterday, and maybe it's deterministic time loop. Just a time loop where you, anything was ever changed in the past was always changed. Or maybe there's multiple loops. And they're all interacting with one another at different points. And you can have something like the Mandela effect happen. Maybe. I don't know. What I do know is that we are going to be able to get access to free energy. And that's what we're going to be talking about here tonight. So we need to see the plane field very clearly. And the plane field, if we watch the Wi Files episode, is interesting. It means there's a lot of suppression, a lot of people getting disappeared. Um, the government, actually, I think one of the key points was the law that the government put into place that said that they can take anybody's invention anytime they want in the interest of national security. And, that, and um, that resonated particularly with me because I've been told that the inertial mass reduction is what's been kept hidden. And if you think about that, that is anti-gravity. That is Star Trek. That's, that's warp drive. And what we also learned from the Wi files episode is that free energy is anti-gravity. When you start to produce over unity, you also it comes from the exact same basis for science as gravity manipulation does. At least, and there's several different ways to perform anti gravity. Anti gravity is just a force that, it, you know, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, goes contrary to the force of gravity, which is, you know, we're going down all the time as time moves forward. So. If you're a Redditor out there, I want you to go ahead and close your eyes and avert, or avert your eyes and close your ears, uh, plug your ears, because you're going to get triggered today if you are a debunker or what have you. And that's totally fine. You know, that's that's the world we live in here today. Uh, not everybody's going to come with us to Star Trek age. We're just going to take the people that uh, do understand that this technology is out there, is real and is possible. Um. I'm, I'm an investigator, so I'm not a scientist, although I, I am learning. I think that if you want to be able to investigate something, you have to learn about it. So it, being an investigator is part understanding the stuff that you are investigating, but is also being a history buff where you are going back through the history of something so that you can understand where it all came from. And that's what we're doing. And it's also about building a story that makes sense. This is what we did in the MH370 investigation. MH370 investigation led us to the potential of uh, scalar physics and led us to Thomas Bearden, which has also led us back to free energy once again and how to explain free energy and why it's been suppressed for so long. Uh, Tesla was right. All the textbooks in the United States are wrong. Crazy to say that. It doesn't take us rewriting all the laws. We just need to rewrite the law of conservation of energy. Um, and we just need to understand the laws of physics a little bit differently. And once we understand this, we will achieve unification theories of general relativity and quantum field theory. Uh, we will be able to get over unity. We will be able to get free energy. 
uh, as we understand it. A, a device that, when I talk about free energy, a device that will just perpetually run and produce energy for, say, an entire house. That can be, you know, probably, I don't know for a fact, but probably like the size of a wallet. You know, very small, very small device. Um, and why is this scary? Because that means Fallout was right. Fallout was right. We're probably going to destroy ourselves. It's pretty much inevitable. It's just not going to be nuclear weapons. It's going to be something much, much, much more dangerous than that. Um, so this is, in my opinion, also the answer to UFOlogy is that there is an ether. Uh, there is free energy possible through that ether. That th ether actually helps us understand why our physics equations are wrong. It goes back to Maxwell. And after they rewrote his equations, uh, it pretty much ruined everything. And that's why we're stuck in this world right now we're in where we don't realize that we have access to unlimited energy anytime we want, gravity manipulation, and therefore space-time manipulation as well. So cheers to that. Uh, so we're bringing the ether back. If you had said the word ether in, let's say, even the 70s or 80s, people probably look at you like you're in the woo. Like, oh, do you are sweet to divining crystals and stuff like that? Sure, whatever, not anymore. Now I think we're at a point where we can bring ether back. Ether is cool. It's a cool word. I like it. I think it helps describe the underlying framework and fabric of reality, like the canvas that the artist is going to paint on, uh, because it makes sense. It's true nothingness, but it's not that it's nothingness. It's the opposite of what we have. And energy, negative energy. That's exactly the thing we need to stabilize our equations, to not be able to break them. It also helps us with this idea of symmetry, which we see in physics all the time. Equal and opposite reaction. We have energy, we must need negative energy. We have mass, we need negative mass. Uh, so that's the reason why I personally like it. Um, and again, I'm happy to be proven wrong if that's not the case, but uh, there's already, as we're going to look into here, a, a huge body of evidence that's been out there for a long time, including patents, that will you know, prove that this type of technology is possible. My goal here as a high technology influencer, if you want to call me that, sure, I don't care is to make sure that this technology does not get suppressed. That's my goal. Uh, people are definitely suppressing this. Uh, they might be silencing people. And people don't potentially have the same benefit that I do in terms of having a huge following where if I go missing, it's very sketchy. You know, other people, they're doing this in their garage. They go missing. No one's going to ever know. No one's going to ever know. So I'm not going to be the person who's going to invent it. I'm just going to be the person who's going to expose it. That's my goal. Um, this tech could make endless money. Yeah, it's true. They are capitalizing on it. That's the answer. So if you guys look through my replies, one thing you'll find as well is that people say, well, why not build it? And I just said in response, how much would you pay? How much would you pay for a free energy device that can run the power of your house? How much money do you have in your wallet? You know, how much would you pay for that? Would you pay 50 or a hundred thousand dollars? Uh, can I do polls in here? Damn, I wish we could do polls in here. I want to know if somebody, if I could, if I charge you, uh, give me ones in the chat. If you would pay fifty thousand dollars for a free energy device that would run all the power in your house all the time, and you never had to pay a phone bill again. One in the chat if you would pay. Two in the chat if you would not pay. Fifty thousand dollars for a free energy device, portable generator, runs forever, charges your own home. I think the reason why this is important to understand is if you are a one or a two on this, is that you need to understand that their economics comes into play economics how much money do you have and how much are you willing to pay for a device like this people are profiting off them and if you know how to make one uh what if you get an nda the moment you make one and try to sell it, it becomes public to the government and the moment you try to go on tv with it and show it you're going to get everybody saying that you're a cheater you're a fraud and you're going to have the media either not cover it or they're going to cover you in a negative slant and they're going to make you look like a crackpot why would i do that i'd rather just sell it for the fifty thousand to people out there and make the money um pretty scary though but just copy one's not it's not as easy as copying it there's that's the thing the reason why it costs fifty thousand dollars because it's the raw materials to make it's not like you can just make it with anything i can't just make it with my vodka shaker you got to have the materials that are required uh you know and this is the this is the rub that people don't realize so people wonder why why have people not produced it? Why have we not been able to prove these results in a lab? Because all the best labs are private labs by the big defense contractors. They're all special access programs. And when you have this kind of situation, then you sign NDAs. You cannot disclose any of that information. You go to prison. You become Bob Lazar if you really do, if you do come out there and you say it. And you become per persona non grata. 
So this is what's potentially holding us back. Oh, do you ever notice like we don't have any major scientific revelations coming out of the United States? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that a lot of the stuff that comes out of the United States comes out from the Department of Energy on their Twitter profile with all the, the things that they fund and support? This is what I think people need to realize about it, is that the United States government controls the technology, release of technology in this country. And this is why Thomas Bieren talks about looking at the Russian uh, literature, is that they may control it as well, but they potentially don't have the same levels of suppression that we do or the same setup that we do. Maybe they don't have the same co defense contractors that we do. Um, and we also this is why we're seeing stuff like LK99 coming out of Korea and China. You guys don't think we have room temperature superconductive metamaterials? No, it's just locked up in Lockheed Martin and uh, Bigelow Aerospace and SAIC and Northrop Grumman and all these people. And they control it. Why would they Why would they lease it, leak it or let it go? The thing about fallout, the reason why I say we're like fallout, it's not that we're going to destroy ourselves with nuclear weapons. It's that large companies and conglomerates have access to the information. They're monetizing it the way that they want to like a business as opposed to the way that society would want it in terms of it being free, where everyone can have free source and free flow of information. This is what makes it so that they leak out what they want. Now, one example from Fallout in this is that, um, spoiler alert, guys, spoiler. If you don't want to know spoilers with Fallout, pause it right here and skip ahead about one minute. Okay, you've had your chance. So in Fallout, part of the uh, idea and appeal is that the government has stolen free energy and that they are hiding it. And that uh, and the reason why they didn't promote it is because they don't make any money off of it. How do you make money off of free energy? How do you make money off of open source information for free energy? How does the energy industry make money if you have free energy? You don't. You don't make any money off of it. You don't have any control. If you control the, the energy market, then you control the world, in essence. Energy is the source of everything. Uh, yeah, don't patent it or you're dead. Honestly, I would argue the opposite. You should patent it. Do patent it. That's what Salvatore Pius did. The only way it gets out there is his patent. Nobody's listening to your opinions about your device unless you patent it and you get it out there so people can see it. It's tricky. Uh, so if you patent and get it out there, this is what Salvatore Pius argues that he did is he put the information out there so that people could patent it or so that the so that corporations could not patent it and save it for themselves and hoard it. And as long as Salvatore Pius lives up to his uh, name and allows people to use those patents, then I think that that's a very noble cause. Because now nobody can come back in the future in like 2030 and say, can't have Northrop Grumman say, sorry, we control the patent to, you know, uh, piezoelectric induced superconductivity or a compression fusion device. Because no, Salvatore Pius has it on paper that he invented it already out of that. So it's interesting. And we did learn in the Y Files episode as well that uh, patents can easily be taken over by the government, easily. Um, so this is something again as well, where it's like, how did Salvatore Pius's patents even get out there? Was it a mistake? Did somebody have a loophole and he got them out there? Did somebody step up? Are there warring factions in the government? Some of them that want the information to get out there. And if people would say, oh, well, those patents are disinformation. They are what's the term that people use? Limited hangout kind of a stupid term uh then go ahead and prove it show that it's not possible you know it's the same thing that you're asking of the other people so uh, if it's wrong and it's a fake so what doesn't harm anybody if it's real then those patents are uh, have the ability to change our entire, entire civilization and then we have to understand why those patents are possible and that's what we're going to be going through here tonight okay so cheers once again Uh, looking at some of the comments in the chat in fallout, they blocked peace talks so that they could sell shelters. That's the whole point of the fallouts. How do fallouts make any, how, how do shelters make any money bomb shelters for a company unless you have war? Uh, and why is that important to think about right now? Well, if you look at my most recent post on Twitter, uh, before this, you will see that the, uh, we have people, a uh, congressman, in Congress, waving Ukrainian flags for sending money over to Ukraine and sending money to Israel for proxy wars that we should have no business being involved in. Because money is a racket. Wars are not meant to be won. They're meant to be perpetual, persistent, never ending. And that's exactly what's going on. And the reason why that's so awkward, regardless of which type of which side you're on. In fact, I'm going to show this video 
I can't believe I wasn't going to show it actually now because just my God. Um, Cause I think people need to see how phony everything in our world is that's out there. And also, man, followers guys love you guys uh i love that everybody's kind of following along with this if you are on uh x consider coming over to youtube uh it's i can't reply to messages in x if you want to watch and be a little bit more intimate and watch the whole chat go off people are popping off over on the youtube side uh you know, you're not gonna have sound for this particular one but you guys don't need it you, you know what the sound of people cheering okay, here we go miniature ukrainian flags and it's not just that like you know one or two people brought them they clearly handed them out to everybody and some people are like nah i'm good without it because it's the cheesiest thing ever miniature ukrainian flags for everyone upon celebrating that we're giving more money to ukraine in a war that they never had any chances they could win it's literally like if if, if imagine this video but instead of this You've got Russia and Russians, um, and they are waving Texas flags for allowing Texas to fight against the United States and break free. How silly would that seem? Russians waving Texas flags to break away from the United States. Now, granted, some people probably approve of it, but for the people that find that thought offensive, imagine what this looks like to like ethnic Russians that are in the Donbass or Crimea regions. This is just a war that we should not be involved in. It's a war over land over the old Soviet Union, the USSR, and it's a proxy war. That's what it is by default. And the worst part is we're disclosing technology that makes all wars obsolete. Uh, both warping objects, sending nukes back on people, annihilating nukes, uh, as well as free energy. Free energy is like, what are we fighting over exactly? We don't like that politician or this politician. Guys, the reason why they don't take the politicians that are in office out is because then they're just going to get worse people in. It's not like we're going to just take over the world, make everybody American. We're going to make all the Chinese people American, North Korean people American. It's just not that simple. And you take out one of their people, it's like it doesn't do anything. You know, there. I would almost guarantee that there's backdoor channels between all the politicians that pretend like they're worrying on the front end. Um, and Russia is never going to take over all of Ukraine either. And even if they do, so what? Let those, let them and their people figure it out, man. Okay, so let's dig into the fun stuff now. Okay, so I want to differentiate between two concepts. First of all, uh, let's go to let's start with. Uh, hmm. I should think I want to go back to that. I want to start with the Hal Pudoff and the Y files. We'll look at more Y file stuff, but I only clipped one for now. There's at least three amazing segments from this. Oh, you're not going to be able to hear this. Uh, let me switch this around. Hold on. Good news, guys. I did actually go ahead and save the, the file for this so you guys can actually listen. Called empty space isn't really empty at all, it's actually full of energy. So instead of being like kind of a quiet, empty lake, it's more like the froth at the base of a waterfall or something. Yeah, so empty space is not empty. And this is what people are saying right now is physicists are saying, oh, well, there's virtual particles and the virtual particles pop into sky space. OK, well, here's a simple answer. There's an ether and we have unlimited energy and access to it. Well, when you go to look at the numbers, you find out that there's enough energy in the volume of a coffee cup to say, evaporate all the world's oceans if you could get it all up enough energy to boil and evaporate all the oceans on Earth from a coffee cup of empty space. This energy is called zero point energy. Yeah, so and, and this is the idea. If we tap into the ether, we have unlimited, uh, essentially. So there's two concepts that go on, though. Coefficient of performance greater than one is that we have our system and we open it up to the you know uh, space time itself. And now we can pr produce coefficient greater than uh greater than one the way this is i would equate, equate this to is the idea of uh fusion power in terms of the tomahawks and the sun when we look at the sun 
is that the sun is producing what seems to be nearly an unlimited amount of energy that's going on due to the gravitational forces and their interactions that are happening. Um, but really, it's just converting um, matter into energy by uh, fusion power. Now, the other way to look at it is the idea of just straight up free energy. Two different concepts that we got going on. One is splitting, uh, spinning plasma through magnetic fields, extremely powerful magnetic fields. That's going to be our fusion power that we've got going on. And then the idea of free energy is that you are tapping into the well. Boop. And the well is just unlimited energy, negative energy. Uh, so we have two different concepts that go on. So when we show later on here, this uh, post that I think is getting pretty huge out there, where we are looking at the electrical currents spinning around here, we are looking at fusion on a small scale, low energy nuclear reactions, I believe would be the correct uh, explanation for that type of interaction. Um, just so that people don't get confused between the two. Two concepts, they are potentially have a relationship between them and are linked, um, but it doesn't necessarily require one, both of them to be true. Now, I do think that both of them are true though, by the way. And it's generated from the zero point field. Nikola Tesla, Nikolai Kozyarev, and other scientists called this field the ether. The ether. And yes, we're bringing the ether back. There is a field in which everything exists, but it exists in a dimension that our brains can't perceive. Particles blinking in and out of existence have to be coming from and going somewhere. That place is the ether, the base layer of reality. But even though we can't see it, this layer can be disrupted with electromagnetism. Tesla famously said, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. So call Kaboom. So there we go. Energy, frequency, and vibration. I, I left a Tesla quote in there at the end because Tesla was right. We do have an ether. We do need to be thinking of energy, frequency, and vibration in terms of how everything works. For the most part, there's not a link between everything in the universe, but there's definitely a link between the idea of having an ether, unlimited energy, free energy, um, and also the idea of faster than light communication and faster than light travel. For how we got here from warping something is that we need the ability to move faster than the speed of light. That means that our reality has to be a medium in of itself. And that means that we are experiencing a refraction of light through the medium that we're seeing. And if we remove that, now speed of light can increase uh, and go faster than what we perceive. And then this opens the door to a bunch of questions, of course, about time travel specifically. Um, but that's what we need to understand is the basic point here. Now, let's now take a look real quick at this device that we're looking at here. And I'll go ahead and say once again that this is, you know, I am a influencer, uh, technically and officially. So if I am somehow wrong about this, I open myself up to criticism on it. Uh, but I am fairly confident here that this is fundamentally the equivalent of what Bob Greener has been looking into with respect to the uh, thunderstorm generator and other low energy nuclear reactions that are occurring is that we don't need people ask, well, you know, how can this equate to a particle collider that has, you know, 20 miles around or whatever they are, however big they are huge. Right. And the answer is because you can scale stuff down. You can get the same reactions on a smaller scale. Uh, and that's what people out there in the field are figuring out is they're figuring out the core concepts and then they're creating other similar devices that can produce the same reactions, but on a smaller scale. And I think that's what we're seeing with a thunderstorm generator as well. Um, when we watch some of the Wi files clips, I think it will explain, there was actually a part in it. I don't know if we're going to get to it tonight that actually goes over the exact concept of the thunderstorm generator with an engine that somebody made a really uh, fuel efficient engine that, that was out there. Oh, uh, so you can't hear this. I'll, I'll I'll go ahead and say what he's saying. He's he's just commentating because some people want to know exactly what's happening here. I think he says 220 volts DC. A uh, 240 volt, 240 volts DC. And then he does. Uh, so 240 volts DC, and then you can see the pattern here. So when you look at this pattern here, you see it as a smooth, smooth, consistent pattern. Uh, and that's what he's pointing out here. Um, I may not know all the engineering concepts that are going on, but this is what he's pointing out. He's pointing out the difference. 
Uh, I think he says DC, but I only have one headphones thing in here. And I, if I'm saying that wrong, please let me know. 240 volts. Look at the pattern. So here's AC, alternating current. Look at the pattern difference here. This one looks like the water is being funneled down through the tube. This is the difference in what he's talking about here. So theoretically, I think what he's explaining here is at the center here, you're seeing um, this fusion effect. And people say, well, you can't do it on this scale, but look at sonar luminescence as well. Um, I think that there's several ways that we can do it on smaller scales. Um, also, this doesn't this look like the Pyromania VFX edge as well? I think this shows as well that this kind of edge where you have stuff coming off of it is a very common um, pattern uh, when it comes to electromagnetic forces. Uh, and somebody in the chat, uh, God, I've never said your name right, Langige, Langige, uh says, how, where does element 115 uh, fall into all this? Answer is, I don't know. I don't know where element 115 falls into all this. Um, that's a Bob Lazar claim. Uh, what I watched Michael Perone on the Alien Scientist, and he was arguing that you can use gamma rays to potentially achieve a stable form of element 115, theoretically. I don't think it had been proven. Um, but the idea, I think, would be that you could use it as a fuel source um, because it's such a heavy element. But what we are talking about, I think, obsoletes all that. We don't need any of that. Um, we can tap into the underlying framework of reality itself and achieve unlimited negative energy. And then the question comes into play is how much energy does it really take to warp an object? I think Jack Sarfati, based on his equations and his S force, uh, I think it's a his S force equation. Uh, he would say that it's a variable, that the variable shows that we need a very small amount of energy. I think it's a variable. Um, a small amount of energy in order to be able to warp an object. But then from the Salvatore Pius side, he's more of the side that we don't need a small, or we can produce, we need a lot, but we can produce almost infinite. So the question there is, which one of them is right? I don't know at the moment. We'll find out more as we go along. Okay, yeah, he said it's VFX. <laughs> Get him. Get him. Um, time crystals, I have to look more into. When people say time crystals, like I think they think in their mind like a crystal that's going to push time back. But I think more it's more of the idea of like having certain structures where you can allow for superconductivity to flow freely, or it could be the idea where like time can get frozen in superposition. I'm not sure though. May have to look into that in the in the later time. Um, let's switch over here. Nikola Tesla generates, I don't even know how much of that is, guys, a lot. 10, 10 million? I think 10 million. So, yeah, the idea that we can generate a huge amount of energy basically from nothing. Moscovium is a form of bismuth? Hmm, I don't know that. Is that true, chat? Guys, somebody fact check that. Joe and I are the Schmuck brothers. Yeah, if you're not uh, the Schmuck factor, the Schmuck factor was hilarious. Tom Montauk. Uh, just real quick, everybody out there who's watching, if you have not checked out Tom Montauk, feel free to do so um, on the YouTube channel. You can watch the live stream. I will re-upload it, although I don't think I need to do much editing on it. I'm going to spend tomorrow doing a lot of editing on some of the past previous streams. Okay, let's get to the next post, which is Anti-Gravity Unlocked. Now, there was an article, I was actually a little late on the uptick this morning that had been passing around. People linked to it to me, I think maybe even last night, uh, about Dr. Charles Bueller, who is a NASA engineer. I've seen his presentation. Uh, I think it was with Tim Ventura. I think he did a past one, or it may, I think it was on a past APEC. Uh, and I went and watched that. And I thought, hmm, he's definitely like on it. He's, he's researching anti-gravity. But my true opinion was that I didn't think he was on to the type of anti-gravity that will break space-time itself. He was more looking for stuff like the Byfield-Brown effect, the idea that, uh, and the Casimir effect, the idea that we can get, you know, maybe if we put plates together the right way, we can get an upwards force. And then uh, this article came out, and a bunch of people linked me on it from the debrief. And let me go ahead and share again. And I will go ahead and just read the quote off. I went through it. You guys can look through it yourself. I think the two most important quotes from it 
where that uh, the NASA engineer and co-founder of Exodus Propulsion Technologies has revealed that his company's propellantless propulsion device, which appears to defy the known laws of physics, has produced enough thrust to counteract the Earth's gravity. That's a lot. That's a lot of thrust. That means you have enough thrust and you can make a little saucer, a hoverboard, or you can make, you know, if you can do a little bit more than that, you can make an object that can go into outer space. That's impressive. This discovery of a new fundamental or new force is fundamental in that it, electric fields alone can generate substantial force onto an object and allow center of mass translation of said object without expelling mass. So they're basically just saying, yeah, we're getting energy out of nowhere. We are producing uh, a thrust that cannot be described by just the amount of energy we're, that we're putting into it. And this is essentially the EM drive. This is something that has been proposed and out there for, I want to say, over a decade, uh, if I had to guess. And it was kind of debunked. They were actually going to put one of these in outer space and test it. And then when they tested it, uh, there was like some kind of air, like it blew up or something before they got to test it fully. Not suspicious at all. Uh, so I was already thinking the EM drive might be legit even years ago. So imagine my surprise when I was looking uh, into Professor Simon uh, Howell's work. Oh, this doesn't link correctly. Oh, what? You guys should have told me this. I want this link to be better. Well, whatever. When I was looking into his work and I found that he had had a source that told him that faster than light communication was possible. And with faster than light communication being possible, I dug into his claims about uh, the science behind it, which led me to Gunter Nimitz. Gunter Nimitz had developed an experiment where he had shown that faster than light communication did seem to be possible, as impossible as it sounds. And his experiment was actually, he didn't show up in 2006 to a presentation to demonstrate his experiment. Just didn't show up. It's a repeated trend, apparently, in this line of work. And it had been forgotten for decades or uh, you know over a decade and then in 2019 some people in a physics uh, contest in in germany went ahead and proved that it was real just uses two prisms and what happens is the laser when it gets through one end of the prism it instantly shows up on the other side instantly faster than the light just like that so i find out about something called evanescent modes and evanescent wave guides Evanescent waves do not propagate energy and decay exponentially as they travel from their source. It does sound like somebody just made something up to explain what they were seeing. So if this ends up being corrected, don't be too surprised. Uh, it's unclear whether or not this type of faster than light communication and our tra uh, transfer of information violates causality with arguments on both sides. If you guys dig into uh, evanescent waves, you'll find these same arguments. There's people heated on one side saying that it does violate causality. Other people saying, no, it doesn't. And this is the part where you have to figure out what is the idea of time travel and what does it really mean? Does time uh, time dilation correct for it? So you automatically show up in the future if you violate the speed of light? Not sure. Only the future can tell us the answer to that one. Um, but it was recreated and shown that, yes, they tested tunneling with electrons with a prediction that they would show up in 500 to 600 attoseconds. But it was ended up being measured in 24 at a section at a seconds, supporting that the particles were tunneling zero real time. That means from one prism to the other, instantly showing up in the second one. So then I was Googling around doing research. And this was back in February. So actually a month ago or two months ago, almost exactly. And I came across a subreddit, small subreddit. The small subreddit seemed to be okay. Where every once in a while, you, every once in a while, you find some genius in these small subreddits who's just popping off, and it's like you find a diamond in the rough, and you're like, "This guy knows what's going on." And I found a post: Is the EM drive a negative energy evanescent wave thruster? I thought, "Whoa, that's weird." I was just reading about evanescent waves in the faster than light communication explanation from Gunter Nimitz. So I start digging into it and the poster was the, the user knew like everything. Like, I think I have a link down here. I do. Here it is. Let's take a look at it. 
And so I start digging into the comments. First of all, they have a lot of sources here. And I read through a lot of these sources and they present the idea that this could be correct. Um, and then somebody, I wonder if they're still here. They deleted their name. No, that might not be the right person. Yeah, so I think... I think this was the person, the OP, I think was the one who was arguing. And people come in and say, no, it can't be real, what have you. Um, and they come in with their debunking points. But the reality is it's not as clear cut as it as it may seem. Um, and this person comes back and they kind of present a lot of arguments. If you guys want to read through this, highly recommend it. And a lot of support scientific papers that it can be possible. Um, and this is what I, I like because I like when you have these conversations. It helps us understand and get to the truth without necessarily suppression underneath it. So I'm not going to dig through all the comments and quotes, but I spent one night a few months ago reading through like every single one. I came out convinced that EM drive seemed like it could be possible. And it seemed like it could be based on the same science that supports faster than light communication. To me, now, two months later, the missing link between all this is the idea of an ether. The idea that we have an underlying framework to our reality that has potential for unlimited negative energy. And once you find that out, then the EM drive is basically a trivial application of this. Uh, and the only question to me is how much force can you generate with it? You can probably get to a point where you can get to huge amounts of forces, but you're going to need to engineer the heck out of that thing. You're going to MacGyver that thing to a point where you where it's extremely efficient. And I think what we'll find is there's even simpler answers, like using the unlimited energy to instead just bend space time entirely, as opposed to this would be the equivalent of a Star Trek impulse drive. Let's call it that, where it's like, I don't want to go the speed of light. I don't want to zap myself super far away. I just want to, you know, come in for a landing. That's why you would use something like this. Um, let's read this quote. I don't even remember this quote, but the dielectric function is negative in the case of an evanescent mode. This means that energy of the evanescent mode is negative in the impedance of, is pure imaginary. As I mentioned, you cannot measure it. It is the same. You Like you cannot measure a particle inside of a tunnel or in a barrier in quantum mechanics. So this, I thought this was an interesting quote, especially because it then kind of links to the idea of negative energy, which is stuck behind this imaginary, or not imaginary, but this um, virtual framework that we can't see directly. Um, so pretty interesting that we have potential support now um, from Charles Bueller that this EM drive might be real because I think that it will be uh, pretty ver uh, crucial in terms of understanding the idea of unlimited energy. Um, so we showed that, okay, I think we're almost ready for the Wi files thing, guys. Yeah. Now, the last thing I guess I'll show is this, uh, we're going to come back to this at the end. So we're going to do, if, if you guys want to stick, we're going to stick with the science here for now at the end, we're going to come back to, uh, the MH370 video here because, uh, pre we might do a little bit of editing, but I'll definitely show you what I mean with respect to why this video is so awesome. So let's skip back from this. Oops. Close that. Let's break out the Y files video. If you guys have not checked out the Y files first, real quick, please check them out. Uh, subscribe to them. I'm going to hope that we're not going to get copyright striked here for this, but whatever we do, it doesn't really matter. I'm not really not going to, uh, you know, quibble about it. The whole point of this is trying to get the, uh, you know, information out there to everybody. But I just, just give, give them a shout out. We are going to be supporting them. So awesome. Okay. This episode of the Y Files is brought to you by Rocket Money. You go. Give them a little shout out to free promotional advertisement. Um, let me get my notes up here. So this episode of the Y Files, as a summary, goes through the idea of whether or not free energy can be possible, the suppression of it. Uh, other devices as well, such as um, Stanley Myers uh, hydrogen water water engine, talks about a product that's very similar as well to the thunderstorm generator that existed in the past. Um, there are shout outs in this to several people. Uh, he shouts out the first one. Let's see, is probably Hal Pudoff, and I posted that clip that's out there. We also see a brief shout out to Tesla, but we also see a shout out to Thomas Bearden during this as well. 
So there were a lot of connections. Oh, and Salvatore Pius. So Hal Pudoff, um, Thomas Bearden, and Salvatore Pius. That's quite the combo, man. If you are trying to reach out to me and, uh, you know, be on my team, those are the people that I want on my squad. Those are the people that are talking about the exact same stuff that I'm talking about. Uh, so pretty incredible. This is why I got pretty excited when I was watching this here today. Uh, is that when we dig into this here in just a second, uh, all the people that we've been investigating, researching, saying that are legit, all are getting shout outs in this. Um, and I think that, okay, if you want my my quick take on these people, because um, some people are going to say, oh, well, these people are disinfo or controlled opposition or discredited or whatever. Hal Pudoff, oh, he believes in remote viewing and what have you. So what? So what? If there's an ether, I can understand why you would believe in that. This is why a lot of scientists, when you see magic, then you start to wonder what other magic is possible. Um, I think that his concepts on zero point energy, from what I've read, are on the money. We looked at his Wikipedia page in the past. Seems like the debunkers were trying to falsely discredit him by quotes from biologists. Who are sitting there trying to talk about electrical engineering and physics. Uh, that's nonsense. Uh, then... Um, Thomas Bearden, I think I have like the utmost respect for. For me, Thomas Bearden is probably one of the most important engineers of the late 1900s. He's up there, I think, with uh, Thomas Thompson Brown and probably predates Thomas Thompson Brown by a little bit, but he's way up there. And then Salvatore Paez, um, somebody that I'm in direct contact with, that I've done two interviews with, uh, absolutely convinced that his patents are real. I do agree and think that the you know the secret sauce is missing from the patents. He doesn't go into exact numbers to produce the exact effects that he's talking about. Instead, it's more of a framework for here's how you can do it, and that actually gives more credit to his idea that he is saving those patents from being able to be patented by third party contractors because this gives you enough wiggle room where you can say, okay, I'm going to use that to create some other product that's similar, but it doesn't let people own the underlying framework of the concept. Smart. I hope that's why he was doing it. I think it is from talking to him several times. Uh, so let's get into this. I think we're going to start with the patent secret patent secrecy laws in the 1950s and 60s. And right before we do that, yeah, let's. I'll post a link for you guys for the Y files. I mean, they don't really need my support. They've already got what 3.6 million followers. And the amount of views that each of their stuff gets is millions. This one's only one day old, already has a million views. So they don't really need my support, but I love AJ. I think I've, I've liked this stuff since I saw his crop circles piece. Um, I don't know how to pin stuff. So if Ahmad can pin that to the top, I appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. Let me eat an olive and we'll get going here. So, uh, Gooby, good to have you here. If there's a lower equilibrium energy state of the quantum vacuum, then the entire universe could be destroyed by the sudden release of this energy from its current state. Yeah, but we've been around for a long time. I think it's the same reason why I don't worry about the sun exploding. Sure, sun could explode and wipe us all out. We wouldn't really know. We don't have an exact uh, understanding of it. We think that it's going to last for billions more years. Um, but I think that just as easily as our, our universe could be destroyed, it could be recreated. Uh, and if time is an illusion, then what does time even mean anyway? Yep. Y files is great. Appreciate you guys. Also happy 420 to my marriage of uh, injectors out there. I hope you guys are enjoying your 420. Uh, and I hope that if you are watching this right now, you are, you are enjoying it. And uh, we're definitely talking about high science. So, I uh, hope you appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you are on YouTube as well, go ahead and give us a like, uh, give us a, a subscribe if you're on YouTube. Um, that does help me out in case I do end up losing my job over this or get disappeared or whatever, you know, um, so I appreciate that. Let's go ahead and start this up. I'm going to skip ahead. So the first five or six minutes are pretty much just um, he does an endorsement, which is fine, but we're not going to replay it. 
The concept of patents can be traced back to ancient times, but the formal patent system that we know today came from Renaissance Europe. The first known patent law was enacted in Venice in 1474, and it was a revolutionary idea designed to encourage innovation. It offered inventors a temporary monopoly in exchange for sharing their inventions with society. But some inventions are legally patented and hidden from society. Yeah, so right off the bat, what even is a patent? Why do patents even exist? Patent is that I can say I, I made this, therefore I have the rights to it. And if you have the rights to it, then you can profit off of it. And so that seems like a good thing, right? I mean, if you want to make something, you should be the one who should be able to make money off of it. So patents will expire. When patents expire, then anybody can make it. Anybody can make money off of it. As far as I know, and I haven't confirmed this, uh, perpetual motion devices cannot be patented. And that's pretty unusual. Why wouldn't it be able to be patented? Shouldn't everything be able to be patented? It's almost like the government knows that it's possible. And yet they, therefore, they don't want anyone to be able to patent it because they know it will become a shit show if everybody's claiming that they've got free energy devices out there. So, um, and I do think that there's a lot that are out there and they probably aren't all produced the same way. And so if you can't patent it, then what do you do? Okay, and that's the case you just quietly sell them to people. And you make those people sign an NDA so that they cannot profit off of your invention. And because the NDA basically says, if you show this to anybody, then I'm going to sue you. Or if you sell this to anybody, then I sue you and I take all the money that you made from it. Interesting, right? In 1951... Uh, real quick, I just see. I don't want to forget this. I will show share an invite link right now to the Discord before I forget, which I will forget if I don't. Uh, this will only last for one day. So if you're watching this tomorrow, may not work. First 25 people that want to join, there's your link. You got to be watching YouTube. Uh, YouTube link has been posted. There you go. The United States passed the Invention Secrecy Act. This allows the U.S. government to keep certain technologies and inventions secret, legally. If they decide something threatens the country's economy or security, it's stamped with a secrecy order and classified. Well, great. Okay, so we just passed a law in the 50s. And when, I don't even remember what year exactly was that. I need to get the exact year. Hold on. ...in exchange for sharing their inventions with society. But some inventions are legally patented and hidden from society. In 1951... The 1951. So let's just do the rundown. Philadelphia experiment happens in 1943. The bombs drop. We dropped the A-bomb in 1945. 1947, Roswell happens. The CIA gets formed and I think what the Air Force, uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, chat. I think the Air Force and the CIA get formed in 1947. And then in 1951, we make it so that we control all the patents. Any patent that we want out there, the United States government can just take control of it if they think it's too much of a national security risk. Hey, Yoga, nice to see you as well. So that's pretty wild. So the timeline there is like, okay, it almost feels like the government knows we figured out something huge. And now from a military perspective, we need to be able to control it. Imagine if we've had this technology for over 70 years and that we've been manipulating this technology for that long. I don't know for a fact that that's the case. It uh, wouldn't surprise me. Part of the thing, part of the reason why when we look at the MH370 videos a little bit later again, and we'll look at the, the black and white one, is it tells us not just about secret information that's been kept, that kept suppressed from us and secret technology has been suppressed and the conspiracy angle. It gives us a time frame for how long as well. We're not just looking at radar dishes shooting up at a plane, wiping it out or zapping it. We're looking at floating balls of energy and plasma circling around the plane in a zero point system. This is more sophisticated than I just figured it out last week and now I'm going to put it together. This is like you're making it more and more complex or more and more advanced, miniaturized, um, adding multiple different functions to it. This is the part where I realized right away this is this has been around for a little while. We're not we're not dealing with something we just figured out yesterday, um, and that's when you dig into the history of it. That's what I think that Wi Files does a good job of here. Um, let's look at where did I have it? 
Okay, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. He talks about some of the earlier inventors here after this of various devices that have been suppressed. Um, I found this this extremely illuminating. I think that a lot of the devices and inventors uh, people have talked about in the past, they've talked had asked me to, uh, to kind of look into and research, and I find a lot of credibility with quite a bit of them. I don't think I agree with everything. Later near the end of this, he actually quotes uh, Rick Doty, and I don't really trust Rick Doty personally. Um because he speaks a little too freely about information that doesn't seem like he'd be privy to. Specifically, I'm talking about the idea of when people talk about aliens and how many races of aliens there are and what they're like and stuff like that. I just don't believe them. I don't, I don't think that they've met uh, 56 races of aliens. I think that they are at best reading information that they read secondhand. Um, as opposed to science and hard science where we can actually prove the concepts are consistent with the laws of physics, which is what we've been doing. Or, in some cases, boldly claiming the laws of physics need to be rewritten entirely. And that's what I've said about conservation of energy. Uh, Thomas Bearden presented that we needed this idea of an energy. And we'll dig into that here in just a second. If I forget, remind me. But if we add an energy to our equation, then we can uh, cheat the laws of conservation of energy or rewrite them fundamentally. Okay, let's look at... 1845 here. This is where Hal Pudoff jumps in. Actually, I think I already played the Hal Pudoff part, but I'm probably going to just play it again. Stan's engine didn't waste energy at all. It okay. created it. But that also violates the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. That states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. But what if those laws are completely misunderstood? That with the right technology, the laws of thermodynamics don't have to apply at all. Mainstream science doesn't like that idea. Mainstream science can go pound. Well, it turns out that Stan's water car was his least important invention. That donut-shaped device was another invention that created energy. And the reason it was classified? Well, it didn't run on gas. It didn't run on water. It ran on nothing. Ba-boom! Ran on... So Stanley Meyer didn't just have a car that ran on water. He had a donut shaped device. The donut shape is our toroid. And if we were listening to Tom Montauk yesterday, when you make a donut with an electrical uh, wire ringing around it, then the force of the magnetic field goes through the center of the donut. So this is a, and please, if anyone, I'm getting this wrong, correct me or give me a little bit of leeway here because I'm still learning. But the idea here again is zeroing out our magnetic uh, vector potential. And if we zero out our magnetic vector potential, then we have a situation where we get this poten this scalar potential, this potential gravitic potential that's out there. Um, this is where we are going to be able to combine the ideas of gravity manipulation and free energy together. Both of them are based on the same fundamental properties and ideas. Um, and I may go back and try to look through my video with Tom, uh, with Tom as well, where he talks about that, maybe clip it. Um, because I thought that was a really important part to understand. Yeah, the forbidden physics donut. Early on this investigation, I realized that toroids seem to be uh, a fundamental shape required for a lot of these effects to happen. Um, and it's maybe like, if you're into sacred geometry, a fundamental shape of the universe uh, in general. Um, and, and I think that, what do they call them? The hop vibrations is also a type of toroid as well. People have argued that black holes are toroids um, or that they create toroidal magnetic fields around them. So you see the same shape all the time. Mmm, donuts. Exact mundo, Kathy. You got it. And so a lot of this, as I keep talking about with researching it, is figuring these concepts out and then um, using that information to vet the future information that we get. We know toroids are the answer, so we're going to give a little bit more credit to the idea of things that are based around toroids. Doesn't mean we're going to automatically believe it, but it does seem like it's going down the right path. And if you do this yourself, I think you will come to the same conclusions that I have. Um, now, we could never even got here without the MH370 videos. And that's because we're looking at those videos. Those things. It's like looking at the teacher, the answer to the test. We, have, we got the answer to the test. We know what's possible. We're staring at it. Now we just need to see, does it match up with historical physics? Does it match up with history in general? Turns out, yes, it does. 
Turns out the Maxwell equations were written incorrectly. People have been yelling about it for years. Uh, mainstream academia doesn't believe it, uh, and they're wrong. Okay, so let's look at... Okay, let's scroll ahead a little bit here. I don't know if I want to redo... Let's go to this part after how put point field. Nikola Tesla, Nikolai Kozyarev, and other scientists called this field the ether. The ether. It's coming back. Also, we're spelling it A E T H E R capital A, guys. Let's give it a let's put a little respect on the ether's name, okay? Put a little respect on its name. We're going to make capital A E T H E R. It's going to separate it from the E T H E R. That's technically it's okay to spell it like that if you want, but I'm going to spell it with the A. The ether is a field in which everything exists, but it exists in a dimension that our brains can't perceive. Particles blinking in and out of existence. Does this sound familiar, chat? The ether is something that our brains cannot perceive that requires an extra dimension. What have I been saying for the last four or five months? We only require two things to understand that the videos are real. We need to understand that there's an extra dimension that we cannot perceive and that space is not empty, and that from the palm of our fist, the amount of energy in this little area can produce enough energy to evaporate all the oceans on the face of the Earth. This helps us understand E equals MC squared and why that's such a powerful equation, why we can create atom bombs. Atom bombs are just the beginning of understanding what's possible. That's why that's technology from 80 years ago. No one, no one on this planet, I don't think, is afraid of atomic weapons anymore unless they are... Uh, second and third world countries that have not been up to speed with everybody else. Have to be coming from and going somewhere. That place... We did this part already. Oh. ...is the ether, the base layer of reality. But even though we can't see it, this layer can be disrupted with electromagnetism. Tesla famously said, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. He tried to harness energy from the zero point field using the tower he built on Long Island. Tesla Link Blue. Tesla was right, chat. Tesla was right. Uh, all the textbooks in the world are wrong, just like Thomas Bearden said. I'm on team Tesla. Uh, this does not mean that the Einstein is necessarily fully incorrect. I think that Einstein's equations are still extremely powerful. Uh, but Tesla goes and shows that it gets a lot crazier than that. Now, Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower tapped into this endless supply of energy. The tower was considered an over-unity device. An over-unity is when something gives out more energy than is put in. Now, mainstream science claims this is impossible, again, because it breaks the second law of thermodynamics. But for over 100 years, science... Chat, F the second law of thermodynamics. Open up your system. Boom. F the second law of thermodynamics. Second law of thermodynamics is a bitch. Forget that law. Scientists and inventors have proved that claim wrong. Zero point energy devices also violate the conservation of energy. That en yep, we're rewriting the law of conservation of energy. Guys, if you're following me, we're rewriting the law of conservation of energy. I'm actually saying that. Yes, I'm saying that. Um, yes, I'm saying that we can warp an airplane. Uh, yes, I'm saying it's Star Trek time. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Hard to believe, but it's true. Energy can't be created or destroyed. But those inventors don't claim to be creating energy from nothing. They're tapping into the energy that already exists everywhere all around us. That's the thing that people don't realize. We're not creating energy out of nothing. We're tapping into the energy that's all around us. This is, comes down to two forms, low energy nuclear reactions, cold fusion, which is a misnomer. It doesn't have to be cold. It's just fusion, uh, releasing extra energy. We're talking about alchemy, producing heavier and heavier elements. Um, and then straight up free energy. The ability that you can create a system that's so powerful that it's essentially producing unlimited amounts of free energy. Um, so the terms are very similar. They're linked a little bit, but they're not necessarily synonymous. Now let's go ahead because... One of our favorite people is going to show up here. So he talks about this guy, Floyd, Floyd Sparky Sweet. Now, see if you recognize the voice here. Fascinated with electricity, he dreamed of a device that could take energy from the vacuum of space. 
So after retiring in the 1980s, you wanted to see a free energy device, right? You're looking at it. You're looking at it, chat. What is going on there? We what even is how do we even produce energy? We just spin something around and that produces energy for us. Let's have it spin. So if we can have something just spin forever, we can have it just produce free energy forever. As long as there's no input uh, or as long as it's able to produce enough energy and keep itself going and then have access output. That's over unity. That's what it is. Uh, and that's a very rudimentary form of it. This is a very simplistic form. You know, if you imagine the idea that we could utilize all of the potential energy efficiently, extremely efficiently, and then we get to a point where you start here with free energy, but then you get super advanced. We get to the point where we're in the three body problem and we are shooting even a proton and then having it self replicate to the point where it creates a giant structure at the location where it shows up. Scary stuff, man. He made one. He called it a vacuum triode amplifier or VTA. So we have a 120 volt fan. As you can see, it's turning at good power. It is providing quite a breeze and it's real usable power. Okay, chat. That was Thomas Bearden talking. I recognize that guy's voice anywhere. It's generating real usable power. Sparky's machine could do more than operate a fan. He fed it 0.3 milliwatts and produced almost 224,000 watts. This was so I don't know. Milliwatts is not a lot, but 224,000 watts seems like a lot from a very small amount. This clearly seems like there's some electrical engineering uh, exponential growth, essentially unlimited energy is being produced. Very small amount producing a very huge amount of energy. Continuous on-demand power. If you attach more equipment, it would simply harness more power. No limit. And here, just coming into view, you see five 100 watt lamps. Five 100 watt lamps here, chat. There's five 100 watt lamps going on right there. This, uh, this device is just running. Now, the haters and debunkers are probably going to say, well, there's a battery hidden somewhere or what have you. Uh, and what Thomas Bearden is saying is that you can just keep putting more and more stuff on and just going to harness more and more energy. Scary stuff. And what's going to get creepy is what's going to happen is that these types of devices also have inertial mass reduction as well. They get mass reduction. They start to get lighter. They can get to the point where they start to float freely. And this is where you start to realize there's a connection between the ether, unlimited free energy, and potentially uh, gravity manipulation. Ordinary garden variety household lamps, brilliantly lit. So there's 500 watts of very real power here. Again, coming right out of the... And for the record, it does not all float. It's not so somebody asked a good question is why doesn't the MRI machine float? Well, it's not its purpose. Purpose of the MRI machine is to detect small magnetic fields. Um, and it doesn't mean that this is going to float. But the idea here is that if you produce the over unity device in a certain way uh, and you don't know how you're producing it, you're just, you know, finding the results, but you're not engineering it for a specific purpose. You can build it in such a way that there is a gravitational manipulation happening in the local area. Uh, take the idea of, OK, so. Let's say that in this area right here where my hand is, there's also the ether is in there as well. We don't see the ether. We see my face here, what have you. But if we were to take away the area and all the air here and everything, suck it all out and start pulling from the ether there, then there's going to be a pressure field around that that varies. It's different from the pressure field everywhere else. This difference in the pressure field is going to create what we would think of as anti-gravity. Uh, and this is the idea that now where wherever your object is that's producing this, it's sucking the energy out of the ether. It's like it's creating a sinkhole, like a drain. And when it's doing that drain, it's creating a gravitational effect as well. And this is where you have to be careful. This is where Thomas Bearden mentions in some of the previous things that we did with him. That you have to be careful because this can damage your body potentially. You know, now it's one thing if you go through a gateway that has a field all the way around it. But if you're in the field itself, What's that doing to your body relative to the other parts of your body? Imagine like my my face and head getting older, but my body staying the same age. Creepy. Because again, here's the thing too, is that time and space are interconnected. 
space time is one and the same thing. So from this perspective, even if you're warping space, like a little wormhole, you're also warping time as well. And this is what gets creepy with respect to the medical healing aspects of this, is that the way this seems to work from a medical healing aspect is you're going back in time. You're reverting the cell to its older, let's think of it as wave function. It's pretty bizarre stuff. It starts to get pretty magical in some of these aspects. And I'm not all in on the medical healing side of it. I don't know all the details of it. This is not medical advice or any of that. I know how people are about there. Uh, for now, I'm just saying that free energy is possible and that we can warp a plane. So go ahead. Good luck to bunkers. 224,000 watts from a box about the size of a deck of cards. That's enough to power your house, recharge your electric car, or light up a baseball field. It doesn't matter what you connect. The zero point field will give you all the power you need. Well, that seems pretty good to me. Uh, something the size of a deck of cards, probably the size of this phone, that can power all the devices in my house, all of them, inclu including my refrigerator and including my air conditioner. Those take up probably the equivalent amount of all the rest of the energy in your entire house. Light bulbs take basically nothing. Even computers generally don't take that much. Now, if you start to set up supercomputers, maybe it takes a lot. Uh, but that's pretty damn impressive. This is real usable power. It's stable. It is not transient. It is not noise. And it is not any other kind of spurious effect. Let's listen to it again. I want to look at it right here. Usable power. This is real. Usable. Okay, so we can see again, this is all about just spinning this wheel and just letting the wheel spin here. Usable power. It's stable. It is not transient. It is not noise. And it is not any other kind of spurious effect. This is a real effect. It's all coming from that little tiny box sitting behind the 500 watts of power. That box right there is what's producing it. Box of that size. Now it's a little bit bigger than the size of a deck of cards to me. It's more the size of like a laptop. That or like maybe let's say a GameCube. Looks kind of like a GameCube actually, chat. This thing is producing all that energy. Something that small. And this is, this video, look, just looking at this video, it's definitely 90s at the latest. Probably in the 80s this video was made. So imagine that this is just the most rudimentary form of free energy and that we can miniaturize that even smaller and smaller that potentially we've been doing it for 30, 40 years, miniaturizing that. Imagine what kind of free energy devices we can have. And this is where you have to be careful because if you get too efficient, now you get to the part where your, you know, your energy device is literally warping gravity around it. You just you can't have people go near it when it's turned on. It could get extremely powerful. Behind the lamps that... Or think of it like this. Now, we see the orbs in that MH370 video. Our device inside there that can manipulate gravity, that can defy the laws of gravity, as well as create their own geodesic and produce the singularity that we see, a giant gravity wave, that whole thing might just be the size of this box in 2014. The whole thing. The uh, coherent matter wave beam patent by Lockheed Martin is 10 microns across. Microns. The whole thing to do all that might just be like a box this size, and then it can just float around. And it looks like an orb because it generates a plasma field around it. Wild. And it might even be generating its own gravity field around it. You know, it's displacing itself from gravity. That's what we think is happening when we look at those videos. And that's the exact same concept as the free energy device. When the free energy device starts to warp gravity around it, it's all about curvature. Little box is putting out all of that power, well over 500 watts, and yet it is receiving less than one third of a milliwatt of input power. Okay, so real quick guys, if it turns out that the world turns to fall out, everybody out there who's watching right now has to agree that we all go back to 50s deco style. I wanna go all the way back to 50s deco. I want everything to look like it's a diner. Uh, I wanna have all the, at, you know, appliances and everything go back to the old school style. Let's just let's just keep it cool again. You know, we've gotten to the point now where everything's so uncool. I'm gonna go back to that style and fall out. Uh, we'll have to agree.
that when Bitcoin gets obsoleted by this, because everybody's got a supercomputer and there's no such thing as who's running more than somebody else, we all have to go back to just bottle caps, something super basic. We're just going to go back to bottle caps and that's going to be our currency, like something real stupid, you know, like just the bottle cap thing. I, that's what I love about it the most is just some basic thing that's at least material, you know, and then different ones that are like rare are going to have higher quality and be worth more than ones that aren't rare. That'll be how we go back to it. So Sparky filed a patent. Yeah. Uh -oh. Yep. You know how this goes. Well, at the grocery store, a well-dressed man approached Sparky and showed him a photograph. It was a picture of Sparky and his wife in their house, taken from outside. Someone had been watching them. He walked me all the way to my building, telling me what would happen to me if I didn't stop my research. How they took that picture through my window, I'll never know. Dude, just imagine you're getting stalked by this, the three-letter agencies back in the 80s, and there's like no DNA analysis at all either, so they can just kill you any way they want. Imagine that they have scalar weaponry from like radars and maybe even satellites at that point, and they can just shoot interferometry beams at you through the roof of your house and just fry your brain remotely, and then everyone just says, oh, you had an aneurysm. It's not looking good for my life expectancy, chat. Not looking good. Sparky reported the incident to the FBI. <laughs> It's like the hens calling the wolf for help. It was. Things got worse. Sparky and his wife started getting harassed. Okay, first of all, right here, or just in general, who's that guy on the left? That's Thomas Bearden. That's young Thomas Bearden. I'd imagine that would have been him in his 40s. He died when he was like 84, 85, somewhere in there, 82, 85, somewhere in that range, two years ago. So this is Tom Bearden in his 40s. He was going around running into dudes who are developing free energy devices, filming it. If Thomas Bearden was a little bit older, he might be me. He might be a guy that is being an influencer. He was a pre-influencer before social media even existed. Wow is right. That's him right there. That's him right there. This... The Y Files is talking about all my favorite people. Just did a big interview thing from younger Hal Pudoff. We got Thomas Bearden narrating the free energy device that he, right before this, uh, we didn't show it, but people asked, show me the free energy device. Well, there you go. You just saw it. You just saw it. Now you may say, okay, well, I want to see the schematics. I want to see exactly how it was produced. Thomas Bearden talks about a lot of that too. He's got a patent. He's got a literal patent out there. Uh, what's it called? Magnetic. Uh, Thomas Bearden, uh, motionless electromagnetic generator. Go ahead and look it up chat. You know what? I'm going to put it in the chat for you guys. Motionless MEG, motionless electromagnetic generator. So you say, I want to see how it is. Well, there's your patent. There you go. You've got every single thing you could ask for. If you're a mainstream academic scientist, um, there are, there are peer reviewed papers, Ehrenhoff Bohm effect. Go look that up. We've got patents and we got a literal picture of a dude here on the Y files, literally talking to a guy who made a free energy device where they just showed it on video for us. I give you everything you demand. Their phone rang hundreds of times a day from pay phones all over the country. The call stopped when someone broke into Sparky's lab and stole his notes. Then, one night, two men stopped by to speak to Sparky and his wife. The men left, and about an hour later, Sparky collapsed. Frantic, his wife called an ambulance. But when they loaded Sparky, they refused to let his wife in the ambulance. 20 minutes later, she got a call. Sparky was dead. Heart attack. Wow, a lot of heart attack guns going out, off out there. Although, Grant, Sparky looks a little old. I'm not going to necessarily say that automatically is a less than 24 hours later a few black vans showed up at the house the fbi confiscated all sparky's equipment and research and that's the last we've heard about it kaboom that's the end they confiscate everything uh say goodbye to uh sparky say goodbye to his research and resonance resonance does seem to be the key remember what tesla said frequency energy frequency and vibration so if you imagine a wheel, it's going forever. The key here seems to be getting, getting into, into a pattern. So imagine that you are a runner 
And when you're a runner, um, one of my favorite shows out there is called Physical 100. Physical 100 is a Korean show. Um, and the Korean show takes 100 people and they go compete. It's like old school American gladiators, but it's scaled up for the 21st century and it's taken a little bit more seriously and not as much fanfare. Uh, but the idea is that in a lot of cases, like who, what, which, if it's person A versus person B, is it just the bigger person that wins? No, there's also an element of willpower. So if they're running on a treadmill, it's the idea of, are you in the zone? When you get in the zone, it feels like you can just go forever. Same idea when it comes to resonance, when we are producing these types of over unity devices. If we produce it inefficiently, then it's going to stop. It's not going to work. If we produce it with perfect efficiency, if we get it into a point where, let's say, our magnetic fields are in perfect resonance with one another as they spin, it just keeps going forever. This can be a situation where it can go as long as the magnetic field holds up, as long as the magnetic field doesn't get permanently changed. And maybe it will in, in some devices, but imagine a device that is perfectly optimized so that it won't. And now you have a situation where that wheel is going to spin forever. Um, this is the idea of exponential growth as well. As you get to a point where it's like, maybe you get close to like 98% efficiency, but what if you can get to that last 99.9% .9 efficiency where you can get this thing where it's just going essentially perpetually. Like it's going to last for 100 years. If it lasts for 100 years, that's good enough. That's essentially free energy. If it doesn't have to be maintained more than even every five years, I'd argue that's still free energy. And this is where if you go look at the Dreadco device, which is a perpetual motion machine, it only needs a spin essentially every two years. And this is a very rudimentary device that probably only uses a couple magnets as opposed to something that is much uh, more powerful and more efficient and more optimized. That's how I want you guys to think about it. Okay, let's skip ahead to anti-gravity, which I think he... Uh, and Richard Doty, we're going to skip past Richard Doty. We're not doing Richard Doty. I just, I'm not convinced of Richard Doty's stuff. According to multiple inventors, many of which are now dead, alien technology might not be so alien after all. Italian researcher Johnny Dotto created a large ring to go around the human body. Its purpose was to alter DNA to reverse aging. Now made of heavy copper, the Dotto ring manipulates the magnetic field around a human body Look, guys, it's a toroid again. How come donuts just keep coming every single time over and over and over again? Hey, look, Cosmic Summit's here, everybody. Cosmic Summit, welcome to the chat. Appreciate you, man. If you guys want to meet me, you can come meet me at the Cosmic Summit in June. Uh, going to be hanging out with some awesome people. Uh, Jordan from Alchemy uh, Science is going to be there. Uh, Johanna James that uh, is got a Twitter or TikTok and YouTube channel. Uh, Randall Carlson is going to be there. Robert Schock's going to be there. Bob Greenier is going to be there. Malcolm Bendel is going to be there. Um, we're going to have to have some good security because it feels like we definitely can't have anything happen to these people. We have uh, high, precious cargo at that uh, at that convention. It's going to be awesome to meet all those people. I can't wait. I will be handing out some passes on my uh, YouTube channel uh, for that probably next month. Some uh, online passes so you guys can watch. Uh, and hopefully with George's permission, I will be able to do some promotional recording stuff uh, and recording of some of the stuff that's out there. Using gravity and frequency. It was inspired by the Hunza Valley in Pakistan, where people rarely get sick and routinely live for over 100 years. Now, most researchers say their longevity is because of exercise and a healthy diet. But Dotto had a different theory. He said the extreme heat from the valley and the cold from the nearby glacier created a magnetic anomaly in the area. This protects DNA and slows the aging process. The Dotto ring was even tested at Sloan Kettering Hospital. It successfully lengthened the subject's telomeres, the part of our DNA that shortens as we age. The ring worked. And just like Sparky's device, Dotto's device could levitate. Then the FDA became an so I think I missed the part about anti-gravity, but he, I, before this must've been a 31 minute mark, he talks about how the device can produce levitation in some of these objects. And this ring, excuse me. The thing about that ring that we just heard is that has medical healing applications. You just said reverse aging. I'm pretty sure at this point that Dave Rossi has definitely had his age reversed. 
And I'm skeptical as well about Tom Montauk. Uh, I'm just, I'm skeptical, guys. I'm now uh, a, a conspiracy theorist. So I'm coming out with the conspiracy theories that Dave and uh, Tom have reversed the aging process because this guy's literally talking about right here in front of me. And uh, that now this this kind of technology, if, if it's produced the right way, it's going to create this mass reduction effect. And that's from the early on. When we talked about the United States government being able to hide the patents, this is the idea of reducing mass in your object, mass reduction. This is what the government's hiding. All they have to hide is the mass reduction and everything related to mass reduction. And that takes away gravity manipulation and it takes away free energy as well. This is why I'm so convinced that all of this is real, is that there's a very common thread here, which while it seems incredible, this this is civilization changing, um, it seems plausible as well that this could actually be pulled off it doesn't require some huge complex deep conspiracy it's just pretty straight up there in the open and all the evidence is out there in the open as well involved and everything went downhill yep they shut down dotto's re free drinks guys free drinks on on george i can't wait get a couple of drinks in me and the next thing you know we're gonna be we're gonna be talking about free energy we're gonna be talking about mass reduction um who knows? We, uh, yeah, we're, it's going to be a fun time for sure. Especially with Bob Green, you're there. Uh, I haven't met Malcolm Bendel, but I've heard great things. It's going to be, it's going to be wild chat. It's going to, it's going to be wild. <laughs> we'll make everybody take away their video cameras after, before that happens though. <laughs> Research. Not long after that, Dotto was hit by a car that ran over him times. Oh, he, he got hit by a car that ran over him several times. What a coincidence. Why is it that every single free energy and anti-gravity researcher starts getting hit by random cars? This car ran over them several times. <laughs> Just had to make sure they finished the job. And then we haven't even gotten to Potkinov and Ning Li and Amy Eskridge. Uh, they have just anti-gravity researchers and people that have been finding free energy have had the worst luck ever. Honestly, the worst luck. Oh, no, whoops. What did I just do? Crap. Well, oh, was that Ning Li right there? I think that's Ning Li. U.S. government. And then everything went downhill. downhill. Yep. In 2000. Yeah, there she is. <laughs> so there's Ning Li right there. Um, superconductors and uh, ceramic. Uh, ceramic superconductors and anti-gravity seem to go to, together as well. Watch my Tom Montauk interview yesterday. Tom Montauk talks about the idea of why superconductors are important it certainly seems to be related to the aspect that the magnetic field bends around the superconductor according to the london penetration depth um, that seems to be part of the key because what we're trying to do to achieve that stress in the uh, vacuum of space-time is we want to get our magnetic vector potential to zero you get the magnetic vector potential to zero and now you start to get these stress in the ethers the great analogy that tom brought up yesterday so imagine there's a rope and I'm going to pull on my rope. This is my rope. I'm pulling on my rope. So I can pull a little bit. And the vector potential, as long as I pull equally on both sides, the vector potential here is zero. The force here is zero. Now, if I pull a little bit harder, the force is still zero because both sides equalize each other out. But there's some point where if I want to pull too hard, this rubber band is going to break. Why is the rubber band breaking? Shouldn't the rubber band not break if the force is equivalent on both sides? Because there's something called the stress the stress energy tensor and the stress of the, uh, the the vacuum permittivity of free space itself. So if you pull and stress it too much, now you're going to break your rubber band, even though both sides are equalizing out in terms of their force. Imagine this same effect happening. All we have to do is take away the magnetic potential. So how do we take it away? The simplest way is you put it in a Faraday cage where the uh, electromagnetic forces can't get in there anymore. Another way that you can do it is you take a superconductor and you have your superconductor create a very powerful anti-magnetic field, if you want to think of it like that. Uh, I think that ultra magnetism, is that what it's called? Might end up being this in general or another form of it. And if you do that, now you can create extremely powerful stress tensors within our vacuum of our space time. Now, this is essentially how you begin to get very rudimentary gravitational manipulation, space time manipulation. And if you can start to control that through, let's say, a coherent matter wave beam, now you can start to either contract or expand space. You expand space in front of you or you contract space together. 
Now, what does this lead to? The idea of an Alcuberry drive. You contract space either in front of you or behind you, and you expand space on the other side, and now you're going to get a thrust effect. But everything within the field is going to look like it's just moving stationary. Yeah, so we need to keep some of these scientists alive, man. Um, this is pretty wild. Also, just if you're interested in Thunderstorm Generator update, because this is another form of, uh, in my opinion, cold fusion. So it's not free energy, although it is over unity. And in a sense, it is producing excess energy. But this is where I would line it more on the low energy nuclear reaction side, is that there's a vortex happening, which is causing cold fusion, which can happen at a high temperatures, low energy nuclear reactions, and you're getting coefficient of performance greater than one. Off a device, it's basically an engine, car engine. Pretty incredible. Uh, this is the stuff that we're going to look into more as well. Uh, we just, there's a lot of stuff to look into. But Bob uh, Bob Greenier has done a bunch of research on this. Johanna James has done research on this. It's based on Malcolm Bendel's work. Um, and he has been promoted on Joe Rogan by uh, Randall Carlson. And Randall Carlson also promoted him on Sean Ryan as well. Okay, uh, so we talked, we looked a little bit at the anti-gravity, Ning Lee. Let's go to 38 minutes. So at 38 minutes, we start talking about the suppression. The American Physical Society. You know why my ears peaked up when we got to this part? This whole, by the way, this whole video, mind-blowing. So there's like a dozen connections in this video between all the research around free energy, anti-gravity, and all the stuff that we've been revealing and discovering as part of the investigation to MH370. The American Physical Society has everything to do with um, uh, everything to do with superconductors. And Cosmic Summit says it's not an overunity device, but Bob Greenier's paper about vortex generators did show coefficient of performance greater than I think 1.05. So in my mind, that would be overunity. Um, but it's still it's not necessarily a device where you're going to get more electrical energy out than you're putting into it. So from the perspective of it's not a device that's going to run forever. It's not the same idea. Instead, what it's doing is it's releasing excess energy in the form of heat, and it's increasing the efficiency of the engine, and of the engine, it is producing no exhaust. So it's like a, uh, a, a clean engine that gets higher fuel efficiency than even a normal engine does, which to me is magic enough, honestly. Hopefully, I'm doing that justice, George. So APS Society. This is where LK99, just like a month ago, LK99 got another um, <clears throat> injection into it in the form of some other variant metamaterials that were also uh, superconductive. And we saw Mesner effect, flux pinning, and they showed equations as well. They showed a fundamental zero resistance. Uh, I saw some science influencers say, well, it's not zero. There's a, a negative. There's a tiny amount. And to me, I think that they're splitting hairs on that aspect, but I will leave it open to being wrong. So the American Physical Society, interesting, because if they're involved in suppression, then that begs the question of how deep the suppression goes in general. Why has room temperature superconductivity, high temperature superconductivity, which was shown by the American Physical Society last month, why is that not all over the news in the United States? Kind of blows my mind. Um, and one of my bold predictions, if uh, I don't think we're going to look at tonight, but if you guys Google or not Google, but look up my Twitter post, look up bold predictions, you will find out that I have predicted uh, in the future that we will get room temperature superconductivity, potentially both via metamaterials and induced high frequency vibrational spit, uh, uh, high frequency vibration. And then I we will also get free energy uh, over unity. And that eventually we will approve that we can warp an aircraft as well. Those are some pretty bold claims in my opinion. <laughs> There's a tremendous amount of pushback about zero point or alternate energy. Why? Mainstream academia, elected officials, and even the media say free energy is impossible. Any scientist who claims otherwise is attacked, sometimes professionally, but sometimes they're attacked physically. Why? Money and power. I was asking rhetorically, but yes, money and power. When Dr. Tom Fallone was working at the U.S. Patent Office, he came across inventions that could solve our energy. So money and power. Money and power is what this all comes down to. People out there wonder, I think one of the most common questions I get 
Why do this to a plane? Why warp a plane? Why suppress this information? Money and power. Why am I talking about geopolitics? Why do I discuss geopolitics? Because like the letter to Ashton Forbes said, all the world's problems are due to political reasons. Money and power. Those are the political reasons. That's why all of this stuff happens. They don't release free energy because of money. Because there's no money in free energy. If everybody had their own power supplies and could do their own thing and power their own houses, you also wouldn't have power over everybody as well. Not just metaphorically, but also literally as well. So this is the thing that becomes very scary. This is where I think we are living in actual fallout. Actually, the game and move and show we're living in that. We simply don't really realize it. The corporations are our overlords. The corporations are connected to our politicians and they're the ones that fund our politicians' campaigns. A lot of the politicians are directly tied to the military who have an oath to defend the country and to not reveal information that would help our adversaries, national defense, foreign policy, foreign security. This is the reasons why the technology is hidden. This is the reasons why disclosure is hidden from us. It's not about the, the, the tetrids and the reptilians and the mantids or whatever. That's not why they're hiding this. People are hiding this for selfish reasons. In some cases, what they think to be noble reasons as well. I want my country to have the most power over anyone else. It's good to be an American. If you're not an American, if you're not a five eyes allied country, the CIA can take you out anytime they want. There's no retribution. There's no justice whatsoever. At least for me, people would probably try to do an investigation. I hope you guys, if I were to disappear, get run over by a car multiple times. I hope that you guys would blast that and blast all my videos and blast the 50 million times I've said I'm not suicidal out there and that I look both ways before I cross the street. And that's the reason why, even if this ends up being fake, that I'm taking no chances. Just in the, even if it was a 0.1% chance that, that this stuff was real, and I think it's more like 99.9%, .9%, even if it was just 0.1%, I would still do the exact same thing. Uh, I'm not taking any chances when it comes to this. This is, as you can see here, as we've been watching this, people have been disappearing related to this stuff for decades and decades and decades. And the people that don't get disappeared, the ones that come out and they're whistleblowers, like let's say, um, and, and not all these people are equivalent. Thomas Bearden, even you could say Bob Lazar, look at what they do to them. Look at what they do to Hal Puda. He's one of the originators, originating, let's say, influencers or promoters of zero point energy. They then link every other thing they can to them, every esoteric aspect, every other claim they've ever made, every other thing that's gone wrong in their life, including Malcolm Bendel. They claim they're scammers. They claim that they're fraud, defrauding people, uh, but they don't attack the facts. They don't attack the idea. They attack the person. So this is why it leads back to this element of suppression that's out there. That from the suppression standpoint, you don't suppress people by arguing the facts. You argue the person. You make the person radioactive, persona, persona non grata. That is how we suppress information in the 21st century. That is what General Flynn says when I literally listened to one of his spaces the other night. This is the reason why I respect General Flynn as being the former director of the uh the dia the yeah dia um defense intelligence agency these are the people that know about it. defense intelligence agency cia uh the intelligence community if you want to call it that the larger intelligence community um they know about it they know what's happening behind the scenes we should listen to the stuff that they say i don't think that anybody is all good but we need to align ourselves with people that are trying to get the information out and that's what i'm doing whether or not you trust Flynn, that's fine. Whether or not you trust Bob Lazar, whether or not you trust Rick Doty, Doty that's fine. I think that some of what Rick Doty says is 100% true as well. But when you start talking about other stuff that is very difficult to believe, that doesn't have any evidentiary support, that doesn't have a basis in science, uh, you open yourselves up and you expose yourself. Now, this is good to bring up because now we're moving over to Salvatore Paez. The thing I like about Salvatore Paez is that he put his patents out there. He's done interviews with people, but then he kind of disappears. Now, I think that he's been not talking to people now because he's been told not to, um, but it actually works in his favor. The same reason why retiring from MH370, even though now we're, we're back in the thick of it already after only a month, um, why it helps out. Sometimes being quiet helps out as well.
Uh, let people absorb the information, look at it themselves, as opposed to it always being about who the person is and what they're saying and whether or not you like them or don't like them. So let's go to, uh, I don't know what video this person's talking about, but you can find this Y Files video. I put a link to it in the chat. You can Google the Y Files and check it out as well. Now, one of my favorite people on the planet shows up in this video. Oh, and, and by the way here, he talks about that how green energy is a total scam as well. If you have the ability to have unlimited free energy, we don't need green energy. We don't need solar power and we don't need wind power. And why is this important? The arguments that, that AJ brings up is that solar panels don't last forever. And when you have to throw them away, now there just becomes more junk in the trash bin in our uh, huge landfills that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. This is not unlimited. This is not a renewable source. Even renewable energy, even green energy still has pollutants related to it. And then he mentions wind power. Well, what's the downside of wind power? Well, they're ugly as hell. And they kill birds. Birds fly into them and they get killed by the, by the windmills spinning around. And then he says nuclear energy. And you may say, okay, I don't really care that much about those. Maybe just a matter of what's the, the least worst thing. And that's fine. That's a fair argument. But the least worst thing is just unlimited energy tapping in to the negative energy of the, the ether itself. Unlimited. And doing that in a way where we put our device, let's say, maybe in Antarctica or underneath the mountain so that it's not going to kill anybody. And then we just transmit that energy everywhere across the world using superconductive power lines that wastes no energy at all. That's the future. Um, and that, and then at that point, we don't need windmills, we don't need solar panels, we don't need fossil fuels. We have unlimited, perfectly green energy. Only downside is you might not want to go near it because it may uh, speed or slow down your time. And then you might step outside the field, and next thing you know, everybody you ever knew is, has passed away. Um, and that's what teleporting to the future is all about and that's what gravitational manipulation is in my opinion is teleporting to the future okay salvatore Piaz, here we go i couldn't believe this shout out by the way your fault the technology to fix this is there and has been for a hundred years here we go a scientist hello uh i recognize you Salvador Pius getting the shout out on the Y files. We had Thomas Bearden and Salvador Pius get shout outs. And I wish I had talked to Hal Pudoff. I think that he's also a guy that just doesn't do a lot of interviews out there. Wow. A guy that I've been talking about almost every day for the last two weeks, Thomas Bearden. And Salvador Pius, a guy that I literally communicate with whenever I want and have interviewed twice that I've been promoting this guy's patents out there. The best part of Salvatore Pius showing up on this is that I was going to post his compact fusion reactor patent. AJ talks about it specifically. I was going to post it today. AJ scooped me. Uh, I have been, it's on my, it had been on my list for weeks to bring up the compact fusion reactor because he's essentially talking about a device that can produce cold fusion potentially in a more efficient way than some of the other aspects that are out there. There he is. Why files is following me? Wait, are they following me? Are they literally following me? I don't know. I'm going to look it up later, but it, it feels like they're at least secretly following me because this is getting weird and they haven't done anything on MH370 yet because I think it's a little bit it's too much. It's too out there still for them. But if they're talking about this, they're getting there, man. They are getting there. Named Salvatore Paez has multiple patents strikingly similar to allegedly impossible. And that that was the piezoelectric induced superconductor, high temperature superconductor. I, I just posted that last week. I just posted it last week and went over it. Down here on the bottom left uh, is the inertial mass reduction. I mean, I recognize them. Both of these, I think, are from the inertial mass reduction, the one on the top left and the, uh, or top right and the bottom left. And then this one down here is the gravitational, high frequency gravitational wave generator. I, I recognize all the, all the images. Guys, I mean, <laughs> what? <laughs> Dude, what? <laughs> okay. Dimensions. I mean, imagine if you talk to me. Look at this. 
I feel like AJ next week is going to be talking about Lockheed Martin's uh, coherent matter wave being patent. Guys, AJ, if AJ is out there watching this and he talks about my coherent matter wave being patent or Lockheed Martin's next week, yo, bro, you at least got to not copyright strike me when I watch your video and, and react to it. That's I feel like that should be the minimum because I'm the one promoting all of these things on social media. Like nobody else is promoting this except for like Jake Chansley. Nobody else is talking about this. Everybody else is going, oh, it's a limited hangout, blah, blah, blah. At least don't copyright strike me when I when I play your video. He's patented devices that use electromagnetic fields, vibrations, and quantum field fluctuations to manipulate gravity, mass, and energy. Inertial mass reduction device for transmedium craft. <laughs> Guys, my, my post, I, I can find my post from like last week on this. <laughs> I did a space. Guys, if you're just watching this, there's almost 4,000 people watching this. Most of you guys are on Twitter. Go over to my YouTube channel, at JustXAshton on YouTube. You can find the live stream going on right now. If it's, you're watching this recorded, go to the live streams. Scroll down through it until you find the one. Uh, space, uh, Salvatore Pius patent space with Jake Chansley. We literally talk about these patents for two hours. It's one of the best spaces you could ever listen to. That's why I recorded it on my, on my YouTube channel. We go over, we read through the abstract, what these devices do, and then what they mean for humanity. Jake Chansley actually brings up the TR-3B. Um, and Jake Chansley and I are like yin and yang in terms of like when we come together, we create harmony. Because I look at it from like the deep scientific perspective and the historical and the, and the science history perspective. And he looks at it from the historical aspect related to uh, the spirit, uh, humanity, all of UFOlogy probably knows better than I do as well. Um, and so, and we both can see the implications of what this means for our civilization, for us as human beings, for us in our conscious bodies and what our life means and what the purpose of life is. Make sure you check out the space and then the stream, guys. You, you will not regret it. Getting Salvatore Pius to come to the summit. Ooh, that's a good idea. So again, I, I've talked to Salvatore Pius and I... I I don't know this for a fact, but I think that he's being held back from putting himself out there, uh, which we should respect. He's done enough. I mean, just putting these patents out there is enough. But when his time comes that he can come and speak freely again, um, I will make sure that he talks to some of the right people out there. So because this stuff, I think, is just it's going to get more and more popular, guys. It's kind of like how people ignored Bob Lazar, you know, back 20 years ago. And then people start to come to terms with the idea that these concepts are possible and that they're real. And once they start to realize these concepts are real, like Salvatore Pius's patents, then it starts to like get really serious. Like one day I want to see Salvatore Pius on Joe Rogan. Now you can just watch my interview with him and I think it'll do just as much justice. But I would like to do another interview with Salvatore Pius because when I first talked to him, a lot of you guys pointed out, Ashton doesn't know what he's talking about. Like all the scientific concepts, electrical engineering concepts are going right over my head. And now I understand them. He talks about the Maxwell equation being written incorrectly. Uh, he talks about Coulomb's law as well. Um, he talked about all the concepts. I just didn't understand their significance at the time. And now I understand it. And now I look at the concepts and I'm like, oh, wow. Like he was giving me the secret sauce. He was giving us the, the secret Szechuan sauce, guys. Uh, you know, or whatever is the, what's the Rick and Morty sauce, guys? Somebody help me out in the chat. Um, he was giving it to us. He was not just giving it to us overtly. He was giving it to us in code. He was saying, here's the science that you have to look into. Look into this science and you'll figure it out. And that's exactly what we've done. It's like the matrix. No one can be told what the matrix is. You have to realize what it is for yourself. And then when you do that, then you've empowered yourself now to know the truth. He has a patent that allows for faster than light speed travel. He has a patent that can change the course of asteroids through a magnetic field. And my favorite Salvatore Pius invention, he has a patent for a tiny solid state device about the size of a deck of cards that can generate unlimited clean energy. He's talking about the fusion compaction device in the top left here of this image. These two on the left are the fusion compaction device. I haven't even posted about this yet. I was looking back through my post and I was asking people in the Discord the other day if I posted this yet because I didn't remember and they said no. And then there's AJ scooping me. AJ is scooping me on my own my own man, Salvatore Paez, and his own patents out there. There it is. Wow. 
AJ and the Y files, you guys are doing great work. I want to give it you that. I'm happy this has been successful for you. And this this uh, YouTube has already uh, gotten over a million views in on, in one day. One day, a million views. I thought I got a lot when I was on Redacted, and I think we've accumulated like a quarter of a million on YouTube. I think I didn't look at his Rumble, but probably at least 150 thousand. And then on Twitter now, I think it's another hundred thousand views. I mean, even if you add that up and you're generous, it's like half a million. This one already got a million. Salvatore Pius is getting huge. And this high-frequency gravitational wave generator, which is not even listed on this picture right here, when the Kim.com saga happened, the high-frequency gravitational wave generator is one of the posts I posted out there. It got, I think, combined between people uh, like reposting it and doing quote posts like, over 1.5 million views. So people have seen the high-frequency gravitational wave generator. When AJ just talked about moving an asteroid, he was a little bit incorrect there, but I'm going to give him a pass. He did a great job in this video. He actually talks about obliterating an asteroid or planetoid, and that is very important. Why did he put planetoid in there? Because he wants us to think about the idea that if you scale this technology up, you can have a technology that could destroy the entire planet. That's the scary part. All you have to do is scale it up. Now you get weapons that can destroy the planet, destroy the sun, create our own black hole, or potentially create our own Big Bang. We might have created the Big Bang ourselves or our ancestors created it. No way to know for sure. Or maybe there is no Big Bang and the universe is infinite. Who knows? We'll find out. I don't pretend to know all the answers. I just tell you straight up that we can have free energy over unity, coal, uh, low energy nuclear reactions, uh, engines that produce zero exhaust or fundamentally zero exhaust and that we can warp a, a 777 from one location on the earth to the other. What a time to be alive. It's Star Trek time and then potentially fallout time. From the vacuum. So how come his inventions aren't suppressed? Well, because the patents are owned by or have been assigned to the United States Navy. Now, I'm sure that most clean energy anti-gravity inventors are frauds, but not all of them. I believe the technology does exist, and I believe it's being used right now by government contractors. Correct Amundo, AJ. Correct Amundo. The technology exists. Salvatore Pius got his patents approved because the Navy had to step in when the patent officer said, no, this breaks all the textbooks, this doesn't seem to be possible, the Navy had to come in and say, yeah, you got to approve it, we have it, it's operational. That's the story I was told, that's the way it's played out. The technology exists in special access programs, SAPs, black budget programs. This is why we can't pass an audit, because we're potentially paying billions of dollars to create floaty freaking orbs. Floaty orbs that can float around and defy gravity. And they can bend gravity so efficiently and so powerfully that they can warp a 777 10 years ago. 10 years ago. It's 2024. We could do that 10 years ago in 2014. This is why 60% of all the budget is basically just lost. We don't know where it's at. Black budget programs, there's engineers out there that are working on it that know about it. And just like Salvatore Pius, if they say a little bit too much, they get silenced. They got to be quiet. This is why Hal Pudoff doesn't come out. A lot of them just don't give a shit. Like Hal Pudoff is like, dude, I'm 80 years old. I know magic exists. I get to work on it every day. I don't give a crap what uh, random podcasters or influencers on UFOlogy think. They don't care. Dave Rossi goes on inter on Twitter and is like, yep, uh, I, you know, if you're interested, hit me up for over Unity. He's got a twin tw pin tweet on his Twitter. That basically just shows violation of conservation of energy. And I'm going to show this one again because last time I showed this, people were like, whoa. And I think it got him a lot of posts. You guys should definitely check out Dave if you're interested. Look at Dave's thing here. Yet again, the second law of thermodynamics is violated while maintaining conservation of momentum and energy in this video. This is a plasma generator, much like a rotary spark engine, I think is what he says.
The difference is it is happening in the middle of a rotating magnetic vortex. So imagine you have a rotating superconductor potentially doing this exact same fundamental property. The power it's taking in is dispersed in the vortex like a hurricane or a tornado. What does that remind you of? Maybe like a toroid shape? It throws debris all over the place, but it stays in the swirl. So there you go. Follow my buddy Dave if you want. Dave was a... Are you guys ready for this reveal? You guys ready for this? Let me go full screen. Dave was mentored by Thomas Bearden. Dave has been mentored by Thomas Bearden. Dave has also potentially been mentored by Hal Pudoff. He's a DOD contractor out there. So two of the three people in that video that we just watched by the Y files, Dave Rossi has been at least at some point in his life mentored by those people. And he did two podcasts with me and Salvatore Pius. So technically you can connect Dave Rossi to three people in that video, all three. That's pretty damn impressive to me. Um, so if I were you, uh, and out there and, you know, you can see that I follow him, uh, this might be a guy you want to be interested in, especially when their, when their profile says specializing in breakthrough propulsion coefficient of performance over one parentheses over unity devices and solid state anti-gravity superconductivity. For the record, I know Dave Rossi is not suicidal. And so if he goes missing, it would be also very suspicious. I just want to make that sure that people understand that. But you guys don't have to believe me if you don't want. If you don't want to follow, don't follow. Now. These contractors don't work for the U.S. government. They work for the shadow government. A shadowy government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, its own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of the national interest free from all checks and balances and free from the law itself. Well, that sounds very fine. Uh, shadow government that's free from the law itself. So if you remember the Hal Pudoff, Jesse Michael interview with uh, Eric Weinstein, literally talks about they set up the defense contractors in such a way with the information that they would be shielded from FOIA entirely. Now, if you've been stalking my replies, you'll notice that there was a supposed FOIA of a signal message between was it Christopher Mellon and uh, Sean Kirkpatrick. Well, the problem is you can't FOIA private communications. You can't, in fact, FOIA any information about private companies because that's not how FOIA works. Work. FOIAs can only FOIA government information from government agencies. So it's pretty weird how somebody would have claimed that their private signal communications would have been FOIA'd since that's not possible. Um, and that's the reason why they set up the information with the defense contractors like Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, SAIC, Bigelow Aerospace, Boeing Phantom Works, um, probably more than that as well. Because the defense contractors then can go work at those people's labs where they have the millions and billions of dollars of equipment that's been put into back black budget programs. That is why we can't pass an audit and they can have energy levels that are high enough and equipment that's strong enough to be able to produce the anti-gravitational effects and the free energy effects that we are seeing. And we have been researching today in the Y files video. There's your answer. You want to understand UFOlogy? You want to understand why we are experiencing a suppression of disclosure? Now you have your answer. This all leads back to free energy. Everything does. Disappearing the plane. The reason why we don't know about aliens or UFO crafts or what the nature of the alien phenomenon, I'm just calling them aliens, but I mean non-human intelligence, which is an all-encompassing term that includes this idea of a future humans or crypto terrestrials or ultra terrestrials, the beings that are sea, busy beings that are visiting us. I don't know and I don't care what the relationship is. I'd like to know what's going on with it, but I can't say that I know for sure. All I know is that we got some crazy advanced technology that we are hiding related to physics concepts that will rewrite the laws of uh, conservation of energy, that will cheat the system of the laws of thermodynamics, and that we have been hiding it for a long time. 
Did we figure it out ourselves? I don't know. Did we have some help and did we figure this out because we saw a floaty craft and we were like, oh, we can do that? Let's figure out how to do that. I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to figure it out, but that's where we're at right now. So if you're out here with me and you've been following for the last eight months that we've been digging into this and you started where I started, where I was like, none of this can be possible to the point where we're at now. Where I'm like, yeah, this is 100 percent possible. And we've had it for a long time. Then you know how crazy this is, that this is real. But you also know that the way the evidence that is real is incredible as well. And now we're going to go take a look at that. The MH370 videos. How did we know this was possible? And if this is impossible, how can we find some videos that show that it's true? Did somebody make these videos that wanted us to think that all of this science has been suppressed is real? That's a pretty damn big uh, hoax to come up with. Or is it possible that conspiracies are real? That the government does do malicious things and covers it up and they would do anything to cover up this science that's out there. I'll leave that for you to decide. So let's take a look at this video that I posted earlier today. I want you to see the massive amount of detail. First thing actually I'm going to do is I'm going to show the version of the MH370 video, the original thermal video. Because I want the people out there, there's a lot of people watching right now. A lot of people are probably going, this guy's crazy. There's no way. There's no way that we could have this type of advanced technology. How did this guy even come up with this? How did he figure this stuff out? Why is he making these claims? Because I saw these videos that we're going to look at right now. I saw these videos. By the way, I've been posting these videos. I get copyright striked, uh, not striked, but I get copyright warned on like 30 second or one minute long clips that I post. I'm probably going to have that happen today related to the Wi Fi stuff. When I play these videos, I've never been copyright striked ever for playing them. So if somebody made these videos, they certainly don't want any money for doing so. They didn't show up for $150,000 that we had out there for months and months and months. Nobody stepped forward. No one wanted the money. Nobody seems to want to copyright strike anybody. And somehow, when we looked into the investigation on the plane, we realized that we never found any plane. That somehow these videos tell a story of what happened to MH370 that fits with more evidence than any other theory to date by far, by far more. The only evidence we had to throw out, the only evidence is the satellite pings after 1840 UTC, 10 rows of data on an Excel spreadsheet. That's all we had to throw out. You throw that out, all the other evidence is out there, all the evidence that everybody else discarded, all the witnesses, the fire suppression devices, um, everything else related to the situation that happened out there, the batteries, all the sketchy stuff, the free scale stomach, all that gets pulled back in. All that's back in again. To me, it's undeniable. These videos must be real, as hard as they are to believe. How could they tell a story of what happened in the plane better than any other story to date? And how can the science also be real and be suppressed as well that we've been finding out that we've just been digging into? The simpler answer, as crazy it is to say, is that these videos are actually what happened in the plane. And it shouldn't be that crazy because nobody's ever made a military video like this before. We're literally looking at the military drone right here with the loadout underneath the wing where there's a modular slot on the MQ-1C Great Eagle where we literally have, you can just Google it right now, MQ-1C Great Eagle. You can find the assets. These assets also, if you Google um, uh, SIG int payload, the very first hit, if you just Google SIG int payload, signals intelligence payload, which we had already determined is a requirement for all these assets to communicate with one another, to communicate with the spy plane, uh, for the person to be you know, manually tracking this drone from like Texas or whatever. Signals intelligence is what they need. Top hit, if you Google SIG int payload, is the MQ-1C Great Eagle. Okay, I mean, show me another hoax video where somebody hoaxed classified military assets before they were even publicly known what was capable. People still don't even think that we have rainbow pallets like this because all the ones that get declassified, they turn them black and white. But if you go look and you go look at some of the old like missile tests, you'll find that they're all in black or a blue FLIR, just like this rainbow FLIR. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. We have like eight examples. <laughs> Pretty wild, man. So let's watch this. 
Um, I'm not going to repeat all the evidence here, but you can tell they're manually tracking the plane. The camera shake is accurate. They zoom in, the shake increases. There's no jittery contrails. It's a byproduct of the stabilization software. And for the answer to that, it's because the contrails here are blue and the background's blue. So the stabilization software thinks they're one and the same. But the stabilization software can tell that the plane's a different color. So it's separating the plane from the background. This is why they fabricated the fake jittery, bunk, jittery trails debunk. And the simplest way to prove it is we were able to turn it to black and white. And when we turned it to black and white, then this became white and the background became black. And you were able to prove that the jittery contrail part was because that it was it was thinking that this was part of the background. I mean, it's such a simple explanation. Now, look at these orbs. Who the hell is inventing these orbs on a fake video with a perfect heat signature around them that shows that it's an energy field, not a ball, not a metal ball? And with the geodesic in front of them. In this version of the video, you can see the geodesic pretty clearly. Now, really quickly, I'm going to switch to a different color change channel version where you can see the geodesic in front of them super clearly. Look at that geodesic. Look at that line. It's expanding space in front of the orbs. What the F? What the F, chat? Now, let's finish watching this part. So we zoom in. We're manually tracking our plane. And when we look at this, the heat signature, when it zooms in even more, and you can tell they're manually tracking and they're struggling to keep the, the plane in frame because there's a lag. There's a lag. Look at the heat signatures. You can see the heat signatures spinning around on their axis here. You guys want to see another detail real quick that I just discovered? You can see the second orb coming to the screen. Look at the bottom right. There it was. You saw that right there? Oh, I went a little too far. The second orb comes in from right over here on the bottom right. There it is. You see it? And then it's instantly right there. We saw the second orb come in on the side of the screen as well. What? I didn't notice that until earlier today. You can see the heat signature is spinning around on its axis. And in the black and white video that we're going to look at right after this, you actually can see it being disrupted much clearer here as well in the, in the back of the plane as well. Is this going to let me slow it down? It's probably not. And then the convergence and the plane's gone. And when people think, oh, this is a pyromania VFX, guys, this zap is three frames. And I think that the screen is 24 frames per second. So this is like a tiny fraction of one second. That's how fast this plane disappears. You look at the pyromania VFX and it's like a whole second long. It's much longer than this. That should alone should rule out the pyromania VFX. But for some people, it doesn't because they think that, oh, they just manipulated that. And then, and then somehow one frame being a similar match on an edge rules out another thousand frames of video that can't be explained at all. So let's switch over. And I'm going to pull up. I'm actually going to pull it up on my Twitter page because I want people to see it in slow-mo, the black and white version. The black and white version, in my opinion, is is amazing. Um, let's do present. Oops. Okay. okay, so this is the black and white version. Um, and the black and white version, this is a, just a color changed version of it. So people have edited it. This is not the original version or anything like that. I don't want to confuse anybody. Um, the point of it was initially to show the stabilization software was um, what the reason for the jury contrails was. But when I started looking at it some more, I started realizing that, first of all, you can see the, the clouds a little bit better. Not, better. not as good as the other color change channel version, but these are real volumetric clouds that we're looking at here in three dimensions. Um, but the orbs really stick out in this version. And so we see that first orb, and then you're going to see the second orb come in on the side here as well. There it goes. Second orb goes there. And it's like instantly on the plane and instantly in formation, which seems consistent with the satellite video. I was comparing both of them for like an hour today, back and forth, like trying to see if I could figure out like, you know, exactly are the orbs like in perfect synchronization, which I think they are, but it's really hard to do because the drone video like goes off the screen and back. Because if, if we could really compare and be like, this orb comes in down here, and then you can see it in the satellite video, and we know the satellite video is not like inverted or mirrored, then to me, that's like, how do you fake that? How do you fake that? 
that's like better than Marvel VFX. I mean, I already think that it is. But here again, like look at the orientations and spins on these orbs here as they go around the plane. Like when you look at it from this perspective, you're like, whoa, this is like, this really looks like you're actually seeing it like right in front of you where you're, you can tell the three dimensional movements of the orbs here and how they spin around. Like, look at that. You can see the heat signature much more clear because it's white and black. So like the heat signature, even from this distance, look at that, how much that sticks out. And when I rotate here, you can see them spinning. You can see it spinning on his axis super clearly as well. Like, especially this frame right here. Look at this, like, it like accurately kind of like blends when it goes past the plane as well. And we're not even in the full zoomed in part yet. And then it gets to the part here where it comes, you know, again, it's off the frame now again, which is like, why, if this is fake, why do you have these frames where the plane is like accurately out of view while the person zooms in? And then these parts here, like this part, just crazy. I, um, I want to show it in super slow-mo. Watch this in super slow-mo. Look at this. Look at this getting blurred here from the tail. Look at that. It, it went, went through the back side of it. It's on the opposite side. Now we can tell. Look at this blurring it over here correctly as well. What did they fake this? They manually touch up each frame? How'd they do this? To me, looking at this, I'm like, how do people think this is fake? Like, so who made this? In my mind, the only person, this is not a lazy, random person who decided to hoax this. Again, you can see it going through the other side of the plane here. That when it goes to the tail like that, and even the front here as well, I think that uh, that one frame, I missed it, that frame right there. The frames where it's like correctly going over the plane and there doesn't seem to be any discrepancies and we know it's an energy field. These are the frames where I'm like, if that's VFX, that's, that's pretty damn good. And you can literally see that the ball spinning on its axis too. I mean, how many computer programs were needed to pull this off? The black and white version. I'm going to take what you just saw right here. I'm going to slow it down in my editing software tomorrow, just like this part right here, so that people can see this in this super slow-mo. Because I don't think a lot of people are switching the slow-mo up, which you can do yourself on Twitter. Do that yourself on Twitter. I highly recommend it. Look at it yourself. It's absolutely incredible. I don't know how somebody fakes something to this degree. I've never seen a hoax like this to this degree in my whole life ever before. So last thing we're going to do tonight, and I thank you guys for being here. This is the biggest stream I've ever had right now. There's uh, 4,750 people watching this between Twitter and YouTube. Uh, thank you very much for watching. If you are watching live or if you are watching uh, on the recording, I appreciate it. I am Ashton Forbes uh, up over here. Up over here, uh, I can't actually see what it says. <laughs> this is my Twitter right here, at JustXAshton. Over here, you've got my YouTube channel, also JustXAshton. So if you want to follow along on that, if you want to be part of disclosing free energy, or if you want to be part of proving that MH370 videos are real, um, feel free to follow along. I appreciate you. We are, one last thing I want to say about it, and then we're going to do a quick meme, and then we're going to close out, uh, is that, uh, there's three people that I wanted to talk to when I started. I had very high aspirations. Some may say it's egotistical or arrogant. That's totally fine. I wanted to talk to Bill Maher. I wanted to talk to Joe Rogan. And I wanted to talk to Tucker Carlson. So far, I'm zero for three. Uh, but I think that if you are following, that should be our goal. And the reason why that should be our goal is I don't think the government can ever admit to this. So the next, and I think that they control the media and the media will never let us talk about this. Uh, but the next best thing that we can do is we can talk to some of the biggest influencers that are out there, some of the biggest podcasters that are out there that will entertain this. I think the person that would have the hardest time talking about this is Bill Maher because uh, I think that he's the most NPC-brained, uh, CNN-brained person out there, although he is somewhat awake. 
Uh, he might be open to this in general. And the reason why I would like his show is that I also know about geopolitics and regular politics as well. So I'd be able to hand my, uh, you know, handle myself if I was on a panel related to this stuff. And I think that we would blow the minds of any other politician or entertainer. And that's usually what his guests are like. Joe Rogan has the biggest reach. He's the biggest podcaster out there. I respect what he does. I respect the types of conversations he has with people, including the one with Tucker Carlson that he had yesterday. So the reason to go on Joe Rogan is although it would uh, polarize people a lot on the topic, there'd be a lot of people that would hate me. They would think that I'm a grifter or a liar or whatever. They'd be wrong, but they would think that. But it would wake up the most amount of people that are out there. The goal of this is to make it so awkward for the United States government that they have no choice but to issue a statement about the videos where so many people are going, dude, what, how do we must know? How are, why are we lying about it? What are we lying about? If they want to come out and say, yeah, we fake the videos. Okay. Give us a reason, man. Why, why did you fake these? Why are they consistent with all the science that everybody's saying that you're suppressing? Why do I have Thomas Bearden, who was on the Y Files episode here, talking about that we have free energy capabilities and talking about we can manipulate gravity through scalar physics, just like this, through scalar interferometry, just like what we see in this video. Government, tell me an answer. Give me an answer. And then, of course, the last person is Tucker Carlson. Um, Redacted podcast. Huge shout out to the Redacted podcast. Also, big shout out to Heather Birdie. If you guys... Uh, need a uh, graphic. She's helped me out with graphics. She's going to help me out with some more graphics. I hope you guys like what's going on and all this stuff. I'm going to hopefully get a good exit video as well from her. If you're interested in uh, her services, check her stuff out. Um, her Twitter tag, if you want to follow her, uh, is at dead blue bird X. So follow Heather birdie. If you want to get graphics, she's been helping me out with that. And, uh, yeah, big shout out to the Wi Files. And then Tucker Carlson, he knows Clayton Morris redacted, had me on. That's part of the reason why we've had such a resurgence in this is that people saw the redacted interview. They saw the weight of the evidence. They heard about the leaker and they went, wait, okay, maybe I don't know if I believe in warping a plane, but there's something's not right here. And that's what I wanted people to realize from that interview. Clayton Morris knows Tucker Carlson. They both worked for the same news network, we'll call it, in the past. And I hope that Tucker Carlson sees this because when I watched the Tucker Carlson interview with Joe Rogan, it helped me to realize that he's got information that he's getting from people such as Gary Nolan, maybe Lou Elizondo um, uh, and, and people like that. But he doesn't know what information he can accept, what, what is real. And how do you bridge that gap? The answer, how do you bridge the gap when you're getting fed information? You don't know what can be possible or what's not. You go to the scientific method. You go to the science. You go look at the scientific method, you look at the science, and you say, what is consistent with science as we know it? And what do we have to change about the science in order for the stories that we're hearing to be true? In this case, all we have to do is rewrite the law of conservation of energy, and we are going to violate the law, uh, second law of thermodynamics. Simple as that. Once we do that, once we understand there's an extra dimension, uh, an ether that's out there, and we bring the ether back, everything you've seen here today will get proven to be true. Welcome. Um, I might. So somebody asked, well, you know, did you not ask Clayton to get you in touch with Tucker? So I got a lot of feedback as well for I had like one of the top replies in Joe Rogan's post about the, the interview with him. Um, they're like, oh, you shouldn't don't look desperate or whatever. I'm not. I Joe Rogan follows me. I can DM Joe Rogan if I want. Uh, so I could DM him if I want. It's the, the objective is not to get him out there. I want those people that want to talk to me. I follow all of them. They can get in touch with me if they want. If they want to talk about the biggest story in the history of the world, we can talk about it. They can reach out to me. That's, I've made myself available to them. Absolutely. The part about this is important is I want them to want to talk to me. Uh, I'm not desperate to get it out there. Time is on my side. I need the world's collective conscious to raise to a point where the idea of free energy and the idea of warping an airplane is not so taboo that I, they're going to be afraid to talk to somebody about it. Clayton Morris wasn't afraid to talk to me about it. Many of the other podcasters I've talked to were not afraid. And I thank all of them very much. Um, so thank you guys very much on that. Let's go ahead and make a meme tonight. And then we'll close it out, guys. Thanks again, everybody, for being here. Uh, let me switch this over. Okay. Um, OK, 
Okay, the meme that we are going to do tonight is the angry, the angel delivers angry note meme. Now, I need to get the right version of it. I want this one. Um, angel delivers notes meme generator. I think we can only pull this off in this one because I don't want... If I have to, I'll use this one. I don't like the one that's sideways like this. I want the one that's up and down. Um, that's also the wrong one. Is it this one? That's not the right one either. Hmm. This is the one I want. Okay, here we go. Got it. Okay, this is the one I want. Oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect. There we go, guys. There's our meme right there. Uh, live meme making. The MH370 videos have been debunked. Oh! Hand it off. This is us to the... Uh, to the debunkers out there, debunkers can go to hell. Go ahead and give them a little taste. Give you guys a little little action on that. <laughs> guys, we're getting back to our core. We're getting back to our roots. Uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of drama, a little bit of science, uh, a little bit of uh, conspiracy, and then a little bit of memes. That's how we're doing it. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out tonight. I appreciate you. Uh, God bless everybody out there. Hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you for following MH370X, and we will chat again tomorrow. Have a nice one, guys. Peace. Malaysian 370, contact with Jimin 120, decimal 9. Uh, good night. Breaking news tonight, a Malaysia Airlines flight with 239 people on board, including four Americans, has gone missing.